everyone sang. Everyone suddenly burst out singing, and I was filled with such delight as prison birds must find in freedom, winging wildly across the wide orchards and dark green fields, on, on, and out of sight. Everyone's voice was suddenly lifted, and beauty came like the setting sun. My heart was shaken with tears and horror, drifting away. Oh, but everyone was a bird, and the song was wordless. The singing will never be done. Siegfried Sassoon Chapter 1 Kalpna Chavla On 1st February 2003, the Columbia Space Shuttle was coming back to Earth after a successful flight. Sad to say, the space shuttle crashed and the seven astronauts aboard the shuttle lost their lives. Kalpna Chavla was one of them. Born into a traditional middle-class family at Karnal in Haryana, Kalpna dreamt of the stars. Through sheer determination, intelligence and immense belief in herself, she became the first Indian woman to travel to space not once but twice. Her life is a shining example of the fact that all of us can reach for the stars. And if her achievements were amazing, her character was remarkable as well. Kalpna had studied various branches of science such as physics, aerospace engineering, space science, chemistry, computer science, geology and astrophysics. In March-April 1995, she was selected as a mission specialist by NASA. National Aeronautics and Space Administration NASA is a U.S. government agency dedicated to space research. It was founded in 1958. In November 1996, Kalpna finally realized her dream come true when she was appointed as the mission specialist on STS-87. Once the mission team is selected, the members are put through strict training. Apart from being put through the space simulator, the training includes tests on physical stamina and patience. During one of these tests, her teammates got a glimpse of her helpful and generous nature. The team was undergoing survival training. The task involved climbing a mountain, carrying large survival packs as they kept climbing and the air kept getting thinner and thinner. Team members started shedding some items of baggage to gain some relief. Kalpna, who was bringing up the rear, would keep picking these up and carrying them along with her. Much later did her team members realize the kindness of her gesture and managed to persuade her to leave the things behind. It is very clear that while she always kept the ultimate goal in sight, Kalpna never lost her focus on the immediate next step. One of her schoolmates recalls that Kalpna told him to approach life as if it were an exercise in rock climbing. If one only looked at the top of the mountain, the track would always appear extremely tough, if not possible. Instead, the way to do it was to approach it step by step, making one move at a time. It would be possible to scale the peak. This was something that she actually practiced in her life, moving step by step. She fulfilled her personal ambition of becoming an astronaut. In one of her last interviews to India today, Kalpna had this to say to children. Do take the time to analyze your goal. It should be something that you want to do, something that you would enjoy doing in the long run. Know that the path is not always easy. Crossing obstacles will strengthen you. The journey matters as much as the goal. Chapter 2 E. Sridharan, The Metro Man Delhi is one of the most densely populated cities in the world. It has a population of about 14 million. The population density of Delhi is about 9,500 person per square kilometer. Earlier, most people were entirely dependent on buses as a mode of transport. 
but due to the inadequacy of bus services and overcrowded buses, Delhi's commuters had to face problems. To reduce the problems of Delhi's commuters, the Delhi Metro Rail Corporation, DMRC, launched the Delhi Metro. Delhi Metro Rail has proved to be a boon for Delhiites. It is probably the best metro system in the world. Do you know, in which city the metro railway was first launched in India? Kolkata Metro was the first underground metro railway in India. It was started in 1984. Metro Rail in Delhi started in 2002. It is the second rapid transit system in India. The best and the latest technology of the world has made it possible. It has reached Noida, Gurgaon and DMRC is now planning to take Metro to the entire NCR of Delhi like Faridabad and Ghaziabad. It is the safest and the quickest mode of transport for Delhiites. The credit for giving Delhiites this ultra-modern mode of mass rapid transport goes to Mr. Elatuvallapil Sridharan, the Managing Director of the DMRC. Mr. Elatuvallapil Sridharan is popularly known as the Metro Man. He was born on 12th July 1932 in Palakkar district in Kerala. He studied at Victoria College in Palghat. He graduated as a civil engineer from the Government Engineering College. Before joining the Indian Railways, he worked as a lecturer in civil engineering at the Kerala Polytechnic in Kozikode and as an apprentice at the Bombay Port Trust. His first assignment was in the Southern Railway as a probationary assistant engineer in December 1954. He emerged in 1963 when a huge tidal wave washed away parts of Pamban Bridge which connected Rameshwaram to mainland of Tamil Nadu. The railway set a target of six months for the bridge to be repaired, but the bridge was restored in just 46 days by E. Sridharan. He was given the Railway Minister's Award in recognition of this achievement. He was put in charge of Kolkata Metro Rail project in 1970 as a deputy chief engineer. He retired from Indian Railways in 1990. Even after his retirement, the government needed his services. So he was appointed as the CMD of Konkan Railway project on contract in 1990. The project had 93 tunnels along a length of 82 km and more than 150 bridges. The total project covered a remarkable distance of 760 km. In recognition of his distinguished abilities, he was made the managing director of DMRC in 1997. This project was extraordinarily complex. But most of the scheduled sections of the Delhi Metro project have been completed before time under the supervision and control of Mr. E. Sridharan. Mr. E. Sridharan has been honored with many national and international awards. He was awarded the Padma Shri by the Government of India in 2001. He was named the Man of the Year by the Times of India in 2002. He was conferred the Thev. Tevelayer de la Legion, Donor, Knight of the Legion of Honor, by the Government of France in 2005. Mr. E. Sridharan was given the sobriquet of Metroman by the media. He is really the pride of India. Chapter 3 Tom Sawyer Tom Sawyer was unhappy because it was Monday morning. Monday morning always found him so because it began another week of school. He often wished that there had been no holiday on Sundays as it made going again into confinement. Tom lay thinking. Presently it occurred to him that he wished he was sick so that he would not have to go to school. There was a vague possibility. He examined his whole body but couldn't find an ailment. He thought he had some pain in his stomach and began to encourage it. But soon the stomach pain vanished entirely. Now he was thinking something else. He discovered something. One of his teeth in upper jaw was loose. 
He started to groan, but then he thought that his aunt would pull it out and that would hurt. So he decided to hold the tooth in reserve for the future and seek further. Suddenly he remembered hearing the doctor tell about a certain thing that laid up a patient for two or three weeks and threatened to make him lose a finger. So the boy eagerly drew his sore toe from under the sheet and held it up for inspection. But now he did not know the necessary symptoms. However, he decided to take a chance. So he fell to groaning with considerable spirit. But Sid slept on unconscious. Tom groaned louder. He began to feel that there was pain in his toe really. Tom started panting with his exertions. But Sid snowed on. Tom said angrily, Sid! Sid! and shook him. Tom began to groan again. Sid yawned, stretched his arms and began to stare at Tom. Sid said, Tom, say, what's the matter? No response. Say, Tom, what happened, Tom? And he shook him. He looked in his face anxiously. Tom moaned out, Oh, don't sit. Don't joggle me. Why? What happened? Should I call auntie? How can I help you? No, never mind. It will be over by and by maybe. Don't call anybody. But I must. Don't groan so painfully, Tom. I feel awful. How long have you been this way? Hours. Ouch. Oh, don't stir me so forcefully, Sid. You will kill me. Tom, why didn't you wake me sooner? Oh, Tom, don't cry. I forgive you for everything, Sid. Groan. Everything you have ever done to when I'm gone. Oh, Tom, you can't die. Don't, Tom. Sid flew downstairs. Oh, Aunt Polly. He cried. Come at once. Tom is dying. Dying? Aunt Polly cried instantly. Yes, auntie, don't wait. Come quickly. Rubbish, I don't believe it. But she fled upstairs, nevertheless with Sid at her heels. Her face grew white and her lips began to tremble. She went to the bedside and gasped out. Tom, Tom, what happened? Oh, auntie, I'm... What's the matter with you? Oh, auntie, my sore toe is killing me. Aunt Polly laughed a little and cried a little. Oh, Tom, what a shock you gave me, said Aunt Polly. Now shut up your mouth and climb out of your bed. The groan ended and the pain disappeared from the toe. He felt a little foolish and said, Aunt Polly, my toe hurt so much that I forgot about my tooth at all. Your tooth? What happened with your tooth? One of them is loose and it aches awfully. Aunt Polly said, Now don't start groaning again. Open your mouth. Well, your tooth is loose. Mary, get me a silk thread and a chunk of fire out of the kitchen. Tom said, Oh, please, auntie. I don't want to stay home from school. Oh, you don't, don't you? So all this row was because you thought you'd get to some excuse to stay at home from school and go for fishing? Tom, I love you and you try to break my heart. By this time, the dental instruments were ready. Aunt Polly tied one end of the silk thread to Tom's tooth and the other to the bedpost. Then she seized the pan of burning coals and suddenly thrust it almost into the boy's face and the tooth was out, dangling by the bedpost. Aunt Polly said, Now your tooth has been taken out. Boy, you don't need to stay at home. You should go to school. Chapter 4 Adventure of Robinson Crusoe We started off on our voyage in good weather, although it was very hot. After about 12 days, however, a violent tornado came from the north. The waves rose high, the skies were black, and the wind howled through the sails. Two members of the crew were washed overboard and after a day or two, the ship began to leak. We changed 
our course and drove out of the hurricane. But the next day, a second terrible storm attacked us. We could see the shore of some unknown land, but the sea was very rough. The rain dashed down, and we were afraid to approach close to the land. Our only hope was to clamber into a small boat and try to row to the shore. Four of us managed to get the boat into the sea, and we jumped into it. We rowed with all our might, but the waves were like mountains. We struggled on, but at last a gigantic wave, greater than all the others, hurled our little boat into the air, and it sank beneath us. I'm a good swimmer. And for an hour and a half, I battled in that stormy sea. As I caught sight of the coast, a huge wave would lift me up and carry me out to the sea again. Again and again, I tried to reach the shore. Again and again, I was thrown away by the raging seas. At last, I was hurled towards the shore and fell down exhausted on the sand. The night was dark without a star in the sky. And I knew that lying on the sand would be dangerous. I crawled away from the sea as fast as I could and came to some bushes and trees. I didn't know what wild animals there would be in the forest, so I climbed up one of the trees and made myself comfortable between two great branches. There I slept the night as well as I could. In the morning, I looked out across the sea. And there was our ship a quarter of a mile away from the shore. I came down the tree and found a stream where I drank some of the cool, fresh water. I lay down and slept again. The sun was high in the sky when I woke up. I resolved to go out to the ship and to try and bring back some things which would be useful to me on the island. I plunged into the sea and made for the ship. At last, after a hard swim, I managed to reach it and discovered a rope hanging over the side. With great difficulty, I pulled myself up the rope and reached the deck. The storm had damaged everything. There were broken masts and torn sails and pieces of rope all over the ship. I went down into the cabins and found an axe on deck again. I cut the masts and ropes and made myself a small raft. I managed to get this raft into the sea and tie it to the vessel with a rope. I found some of the seamen's boxes on board and filled them with stores, bread, rice, cheese, and some wine. I also found some clothes and in the captain's cabin two guns, a pair of pistols, and some powder and shot. All these I piled on to the raft, and having found a broken oar, I cast off from the vessel and started for the shore. When I reached the sand, I carried the things up onto dry land. The next morning, I walked along the shore and up a little hill. From there, I could see that I was on an island. I was a prisoner without a friend in the world. There was no one living on the island. But wild beasts. The next day, I went back across the sea and brought more stores from the ship. Every day, I toiled. I brought tools, wood, rope, nails, sails, and clothes, guns, and ammunition, and sugar, and flour, and bread. In one of the wooden boxes, I found gold and silver coins. The sunshine made them sparkle. What use are you to me? I asked, "Everyone in the world desires you, but me." When I got back to my island, I noticed that the sky was black. Great clouds rolled up from the west. The rain poured down. I saw the ship out at the sea rise and then sink beneath a huge wave. During the next few months, I busied myself in making a house with a strong stockade round it. I used one of the sails from the ship for the roof. I cut down tree trunks and carried them to the house, and slowly built a strong stockade to keep out wild animals. The months passed in hard work, and one day I set out to explore the whole island. The journey took me three days, 
and when I got to the other side of the island, I found a delightful valley. There were wild grapes and limes, and I collected a quantity of these and took them back to my house. One day in the forest, not far from my house, I found some wild goats. I was just about to shoot one when I saw at my feet a baby goat. I picked it up and carried it to home with me. In a few days it became quite tame and after that it never left my side. After a year or two on the island, I decided to make a boat. Taking the examples of Negroes and Indians, I wondered if I could build a canoe. I chose a tree in the woods and with much difficulty cut it down and began to build a kind of boat. But I failed to consider how I was to get it to the sea, which was 45 fathoms of land away. After five months, I finished the boat. I tried to get it into the water, but it was too heavy to move. I thought of the possibility of bringing water to the boat by digging a series of trenches. But this endeavor also failed, and with great reluctance, I gave this attempt over also. This endeavor was profitable because it taught me an important lesson. The folly of beginning a work before we count the cost and before we judge rightly of our own strength to go through with it. This work took me through my fourth year on the island. Thinking again on my condition, I realized that on the island my wants were supplied. I had more materials than I needed to work with and I was delivered from temptation. I suffered neither from lust, pride, nor greed. I now found my life to be much easier than before. I taught myself how to make pots out of mud and how to make them hard and durable by burning them. I grew some corn and rice and also some wheat and I taught myself to make bread. My life on the island was a happy one. I had a good house, plenty to eat and plenty of work to do. One day I was walking along the seashore thinking about my home across the seas. When I suddenly looked down, there on the sand in front of me was a clear footprint. It was not mine, but the footprint of another man. Chapter 1 Prepositions a preposition is a word that tells the position of a noun or pronoun with some other words in the sentence. Examples The bowl is on the table. The lion jumped into the well. The words on and into show positions of the bowl and the lion respectively. So, they are prepositions. Prepositions of place In, at, on we use in for cities, countries, etc. Examples My uncle lives in Malaysia. I live in Mumbai. We use at for an address and name of a building. Examples We will meet at the Red Fort. They live at Patel Nagar in New Delhi. We use on to show position on a horizontal surface. Example The pillows are lying on the bed. I found some coins lying on the ground. More about prepositions. Let us discuss the correct use of some prepositions. Among or between. For two people or things we use between. For more than two people or things we use among. Examples. Nina is standing between Rima and Bhargavi. Nina is standing among her friends. There is no difference between the two books. He distributed the chocolates among his classmates. Into or in. In shows position in one place. Into shows movement from one place to another. Examples. Yash is in the pool. Yash is jumping into the pool. Nisha is in the kitchen. My mother is going into the kitchen. Beside or besides. Beside means at the side of or nearby. Besides means in addition to. Examples Come and sit beside me. Besides speaking, I also like to write.
Chapter 2 Conjunctions A conjunction is a word that joins words, phrases or sentences. Most common conjunctions are and, but, or, because. We use and to join things, persons or ideas that are similar. Examples, butter and ghee are rich in fats. Raja Ram Mohan Roy and Dayanand Saraswati were great social reformers. We use but to join things or persons with opposite ideas. Example, Aman is punctual but Tanish is very lazy. We use or to show a choice. Example, you can speak in English or in Hindi. We use because to show reason. Example, water vapor is formed because of the evaporation of water from the surface of water bodies. Some more conjunctions are given in the following sentences. Read them carefully. Mohan went to school, though or although he was unwell. Wait here till I come back. They started their journey when the rain stopped. You cannot pass the examination unless you study hard. He is not well, so he will not attend the class. We cannot watch the movie if we are late.
Chapter 3 Articles We use articles before singular countable nouns. Article A is used before a word beginning with a consonant sound. Examples A book A bird A girl Article N is used before a word beginning with a vowel sound. Examples An owl An ant An India some words begin with a consonant but give a vowel sound. We use an before such words. Examples an R, an honest, an MLA. Some words begin with a vowel but give a consonant sound. We use a before such words. Examples a university, a European. The is a definite article. We use it to talk about a specific thing. Examples, the sun, the Himalayas, the book on the table, etc. Chapter 4. Punctuation Punctuation is very important because it makes the meaning of a sentence clear and indicates the pauses. It also makes clear whether a sentence is a statement, a question or an exclamation. Incorrect punctuation can change the meaning of a sentence. Given below are the most common punctuation marks. Full stop, comma, colon, semicolon, question mark, exclamation mark, marks of quotation or full stop. Full stop shows a long pause. It is used at the end of a statement or a command. Examples She ran very fast. The sun rises in the east. The full stop is also used in abbreviations. Today, abbreviations are used without dots also. Examples BA, MBA, MLA or BA, MBA, MLA. Comma Comma is used to separate words. Examples, he wants a pen, a pencil and a notebook. He ate an apple, an orange and a banana. It is used to separate case in a position. Examples, he is Mr. John, Dick's father. She is Minu, the monitor of the class. It is used after yes and no. Examples, yes, I am ready. No, I am not ready. It is used to separate the reporting verb from the reported speech. Examples I said to her, What are you doing? The teacher says, The earth revolves around the sun. Semicolon Semicolon is used to show a longer pause than a comma. Example He came, he saw, he left. Colon Colon is used to show a longer pause than the semicolon. Examples He said, I am leaving just now. Many cricketers have done a lot for the game. Sunil Gavaskar, Sachin Tendulkar and MS Dhoni. Question mark. Question mark is used at the end of an interrogative sentence. Examples. Where do you live? Is it raining? What do you want? Exclamation mark. Exclamation mark is used after an interjection or an exclamatory sentence. Examples. How sad you have failed. What a pretty girl. How wonderful. What a dangerous animal. Quotation marks or Quotation marks are used in the beginning and after the end of the quotation. Examples She said, I am very happy. They say, You are beautiful. I want to leave, said she. Chapter 5 Synonyms and Antonyms Synonyms 
Synonyms are the words that spell differently, but their meaning is almost the same. Examples Benefit, Advantage, Make, Prepare, Salient, Important. Look at some common synonyms listed below. Words Synonyms Abandon, Leave, Vacate, Ability, Capacity, Potential, Affluent, Plentiful, Rich, Avoid, Ignore, Shun, baffle, confuse, deceive, barren, desolate, sterile, better, superior, well, bold, daring, fearless, casual, informal, natural, seize, desist, stop, competent, able, capable, craving, desire, longing, damp, moist, wet, decay, decline, Rot, disclose, announce, reveal, estimate, guess, predict, flatter, compliment, praise, genuine, actual, real, habitual, accustomed, regular, harsh, hard, coarse, imitate, copy, reflect, impatient, anxious, eager, lean, slim, thin, garbage, Trash, leave, abandon, desert, match, agree, correspond, merge, blend, fuse, narrow, confined, restricted, negotiate, bargain, deal, pain, ache, discomfort, pause, break, cease, rank, position, grade, sanction, approval, permit, slight, Delicate, slender, transfer, convey, exchange, variety, assortment, diversity, raise, lift, garbage, rubbish. Antonyms An antonym is a word or phrase that is opposite in meaning to a particular word or a phrase in the same language. When we say the words present and absent are antonyms, we mean the word present is opposite in meaning to the word absent. Some common antonyms are listed below. Words, antonyms, able, unable, above, below, absence, presence, accept, refuse, accurate, inaccurate, advantage, disadvantage, alive, dead, always, never, agree, disagree, beautiful, Ugly, better, worse, bitter, sweet, brave, coward, broad, narrow, callous, kind, capable, incapable, cheap, expensive, clever, stupid, correct, incorrect, comfort, discomfort, cruel, kind, danger, safety, deep, shallow, decrease, increase. Demand, supply, difficult, easy, disappear, appear, discourage, encourage, east, west, entrance, exit, exciting, boring, expand, contract, export, import, exterior, interior, external, internal, fail, succeed, foolish, wise, Freedom, Captivity Fold, Unfold, Frequent, Seldom, Forget, Remember, Friend, Enemy, Fortunate, Unfortunate, Granted, Refused, Guest, Host, Guilty, Innocent, Handsome, Ugly, Harmful, Harmless, Hide, Depth, Honest, Dishonest, include, exclude, inferior, superior, inhale, exhale, interior, exterior, interesting, uninteresting, justice, injustice, knowledge, ignorance, lawful, unlawful, landlord, tenant, lender, borrower, loyal, disloyal, master, servant, Mature, 
immature, maximum, minimum, minority, majority, miser, spendthrift, narrow, wide, obedient, disobedient, occupied, free, offer, refuse, optimist, pessimist, patient, impatient, please, displease, plentiful, scars, possible, impossible, poverty, wealth, qualified, unqualified, rapid, slow, rough, smooth, security, insecurity, sorrow, joy, success, failure, truth, untruth, lie, vacant, occupied, valuable, valueless, victory, defeat, virtue, wise, visible, invisible. Formation of antonyms. We can make antonyms of some words by making use of prefixes like an, in, im, ir, this. For example, un, like, unlike, qualified, unqualified, in, secure, insecure, decent, indecent, im, mature, immature, patient, impatient, irresponsible, irresponsible, rational, irrational, this, please, this, please, advantage, disadvantage. Chapter 6. Message Writing Writing a message is an art. We should keep the following points in mind while writing a message. Write the date and time. Write only the key points of information. Write your name at the end. Let us learn how to write a message through an example. Nancy Hello, may I speak to Ria? Mrs. Kanika I'm sorry, Ria has gone to her aunt's house. She'll be back at 7 tonight. May I know who's speaking? Nancy. Auntie, I'm Nancy. Mrs. Kanika. How are you, Nancy? Do you want to leave any message for Ria? Nancy. I'm fine, I'm fine, Auntie. Tell Ria that I brought her English workbook in my bag today by mistake. Tell her that I'll bring it to school tomorrow. Mrs. Kanika. Don't worry, Nancy. I'll tell her. Mrs. Kanika has to go to the doctor. So, she leaves the following message for her daughter, Ria. 5th April, 6 p.m. Ria. Nancy made a call to inform you that she put your English workbook in her bag today by mistake. She will bring it to school tomorrow. Mom. Read the following conversation. Write a message imagining yourself as Anshul for your younger brother, Aman. Atul. May I speak to Aman? Anshul. I'm sorry, Aman has gone to attend his tuition class. May I know who's calling? I'm Anshul, Aman's brother. Atul. I'm Atul, Aman's classmate. Anshul. How are you, Atul? Any message for Aman? Atul. Yes, please. Ask him to give me a call. Anshul. Don't worry, Atul. I'll ask him. Anshul has to go out to attend his own tuition class. Write a message on behalf of Anshul for Aman in the given space. Chapter 7 Notice Writing while writing a notice, you should keep the following points in your mind. Write the name of the school at the top center. Write the date on the left. Make a catchy heading for the notice. Write the message in short and to the point. Write your name and class at the end. Read the following notice. Aryan has lost his English grammar book in school. He puts up the following notice on the school notice board. ABC Public School, Delhi. 
Notice, 10th January, 2017. Lost, lost, lost. I have lost my English grammar book, class 5th in the school. My name is written in bold on the reverse of the hardbound cover. Anybody who finds the book may please deposit it in the office. I shall be highly thankful for the favor. Aryan, class 5th. You are Simran, the welfare secretary of your school. The principal has asked you to write a notice on the following subject. Read the subject and write the notice in your notebook. Some students leave the water taps running after using water. Chapter 8. Letter Writing Letters are very important means of communication. Every educated person should know to write a clear and readable letter. The main parts of an informal letter are as follows. Sender's address, date, salutation or greeting, body of the letter, complimentary close. Read the following informal letter. Prachi writes a letter to her younger brother, Yash who is at a boarding school, advising him to keep himself physically fit. 20 Anand Niketan, New Delhi, 20th November, 2000 Dear Yash, all of us are very glad to hear that you have scored 90% marks in the examination. At the same time, we are worried about your health. Let me tell you, Yash, health is as important as education. In fact, only a healthy body possesses a healthy mind. And it is only a healthy mind that can be good at studies. Don't worry, I'm not asking you to divert your attention from studies. What I suggest to you is to spare a little time to do some physical exercises daily. The physical exercises may include a morning or evening walk or playing an outdoor game. Do some physical exercises, yes, and see how you take up your studies better. Bye-bye. Your loving sister, Prachi. Let's see one more example of informal letter. Write a letter to your friend telling her about your summer vacations in Kashmir. Hut number 16. Tourist Huts, Pehalgam, Kashmir. 20th January 2017. Dear Avantika, I am enjoying in the cool valley of Kashmir. I hope you are also enjoying your holidays. We are staying in the tourist huts built by the government. The huts are built on a hill. Kashmir is truly beautiful. We have seen the beautiful Mughal gardens in Srinagar and went for boating in Dal Lake in boats called Shikara. Small Kashmiri girls sell lovely flowers in the lake on boats. I also went for a sledge ride to the snow-covered mountain of Kilanmurg. We went to Kulmarg. These are one of the finest golf grounds in the world. I went for horse riding in Gulmarg. Now we are in Pehelgam. It is a small place in Kashmir. It is quite cold here in summers too. In winters, people move down to lower areas. A river named Aru flows through this place. The water is so cold here that yesterday we put bottles of cold drinks and mangoes in a plastic bag and held them in the river water. In 10 minutes, the drinks and fruits were chilled. Kashmir is a wonderful place. You should also visit this state. I have taken and saved many pictures in my mobile phone. I'll show you the pictures when we meet. Your friend, Aranya. We write informal letters to our friends and family members. We write formal letters to the principals of school and official organizations. The main parts of a formal letter are as follows. Sender's complete address, date, receiver's address, subject of the letter, greeting, body of the letter, complimentary close, signature. Ankit Sharma writes a letter to the school administrative officer to request for including a new route to the existing bus route. 
Read the letter written by him. 3 Oblique 24, Gali No. 6, Siddharth Vihar, Ghaziabad, UP. 12th January 2017. The Principal, Kamal Public School, Ghaziabad. Subject, Request for Change in School Bus Route. Dear Sir, I am a student of Class 5th of your school. This is to inform you that school bus number 8 plies on a route close to our house. It turns away from Vijayanagar, check post. There are about 8 unfilled seats in the bus. If the route of the bus is changed slightly, there are 5 students interested in joining the school bus. The bus will need to cross the Vijayanagar check post before turning. On behalf of 5 students, I request you to grant permission for this change in route so that we may avail the bus services. Yours sincerely, Ankit Sharma
Chapter 9 Comprehension There is a passage in a comprehension exercise on the basis of which questions are set to assess the student's ability to understand the content of the given text. Before answering the questions, read the passage or poem thoroughly. Chapter 10. Paragraph Writing A paragraph is a group of sentences on a particular topic. These sentences are closely related and arranged in a systematic manner. A paragraph may stand independently as a piece of composition. It may also be a part of a long composition like an essay. Main Features of a Paragraph Unity Unity of a paragraph means that the paragraph deals with one main topic. For this reason, we should write the topic sentence at the beginning of the paragraph. Coherence Coherence of a paragraph means that all the sentences of the paragraph are well connected to each other. They should also be connected to the main topic. Coherence implies writing in a systematic manner. Variety Variety of a paragraph means variety in the construction of sentences. Sentences should be of different lengths. Method of writing a paragraph. Think about the subject and note down the points. The points must be strictly related to the subject. Arrange all the points in a systematic manner. If possible, begin the paragraph with a topical sentence. The last sentence should give out the conclusion. In other words, it should prove the point. Keep to the word limit, if given. Let's read some sample paragraphs. Importance of morning walk Morning walk is not only pleasant, but also extremely good for health. The atmosphere in the morning is quite pleasant and fresh. There is the music of early birds and the beauty of the rising sun. Besides the pleasure that a morning walk gives, it makes us lively and helps us begin the day on an active note. The fresh air that we breathe freshens up our lungs. We find ourselves ready to begin the day actively. The benefits are many. So, become an early riser. If you rise early and go for a walk, you give away nothing but get a lot. Value of Moral Education the importance of moral education can neither be denied nor overlooked. Though the importance of physical education has been well recognized, moral education has not received its due recognition. It is moral education alone which can teach the students what is good and what is bad. It underlines virtues that are needed for a well-civilized society. We see lawlessness and growing indiscipline among the youth of today. It is moral education that will promote good character in school and college students. It will make them pious, noble and virtuous. It will enable them distinguish between good and bad. Moral education will help the students grow up into good citizens. Hence, moral education should be compulsorily taught in schools and colleges. My pet. My pet is a small puppy. I have just named it Tom. He is a small pup with jet black fur. There are white patches of fur on his eyes. His eyes have a sparkle in them. Tom is so small that he has barely started to run. He sniffs the place all the time. I cuddle him in my lap. He licks me with his tiny red tongue. His nostrils are always wet. 
I like to play with him all the time I get. He follows me around the house when I put him on the floor. I get instructions to wash my hands every time I touch my bed. I have lost count of number of times I wash my hands. Tom is not toilet trained yet and he pees around the house. That is why mother keeps a check if I put him on the sofa or bed. Everyone in the house is trying to teach something to Tom. My poor little pup looks so confused and baffled. I just want to protect him from all. I am very happy to have a pet. Importance of Science and Technology Science and technology has made our life comfortable and secure. Human sufferings have lessened as a result of advances in science and technology. Cures have been found for many diseases. With advancement in medical science, life expectancy has also increased. Science and technology has removed many superstitions from society. However, science and technology is accompanied by its own ills. There are many deadly arms and instruments of warfare that can destroy mankind many times over and cause untold and prolonged misery to the rest of society, like the atom bombs over Japan and the mobile gas tragedy. Chapter 11 Story Writing let us learn how to write a story with the help of given outlines. A king, known for his justice, two women came to court, fighting over a child, each claiming the boy to be her son. King listened patiently. The king ordered, cut the child into two, give one half to each. One of the women cried, child is not mine, don't cut it, give it to the other woman. King announced, this is the real mother. She cannot see harm to her son. Give the child to this woman. Story A king was known for his justice. One day, two women came to his court. They were fighting over a child. Each was claiming the child to be her own son. The king listened to them carefully and ordered to cut the child into two and give one half to each woman. One of the women cried, this is not my child. Give it to the other woman. The king announced, She is the real mother. She cannot see harm to her son. He ordered to give the child to that woman. Chapter 1. Basic Geometrical Concepts In the previous class, we have learned about basic concepts of geometry such as point, line, line segment and ray. Let us first revise them and then study them in detail. Detailed Study of Point, Line, Line Segment and Ray Point A point is an idea which is represented by a dot. It is named by a capital letter of the English alphabet. A point has no length, breadth, height, size and shape. It only has a position. Here, two points X and Y are shown. Line A line is a straight path of points which can be extended to any length on both sides. A line has no end points. It has no definite length. In the figure shown alongside AB is a line. Remember, practically we are unable to draw a line on a sheet of paper. We can draw only a part of a line and put arrowhead on both sides. We can represent this line as AB, line AB or BA, line BA. 
Sometimes a line is represented by a small letter like small l, small m, small p, small q, etc. In the figure shown below, small m is a line. Line segment. A line segment is a part of a line. It has a definite length. It is named by using capital letter of the English alphabet. In the figure shown alongside, AB is a line segment. A and B are endpoints of the line segment AB. Clearly, a line segment has two endpoints. Ray. A ray is a part of a line having one endpoint and extending endlessly in other direction. The endpoint of the ray is called its initial point. In the figure given alongside, PQ is a ray. It starts from its initial point P and passes through Q, extending indefinitely in the direction of Q. PQ and QP are not the same rays. They are two different rays. Plain. We come across various objects or things having flat surfaces in our daily life. The surface of a paper, the face of the blackboard, screen of a flat TV, floor of a house, top of a table, etc. are all flat surfaces. In mathematics, a plane may be defined as follows. A plane is a flat surface that goes endlessly or extends indefinitely in all directions. A plane has no boundary, that is, we cannot draw a plane on a sheet of a paper. We can draw only a part of plane. We draw figures such as square, triangle, rectangle, circle, etc. in a place. So, we call them plane figure. Remember, a plane is a collection of an infinite number of points. We can name a plane by writing any three points on it. The above given figure shows plane ABC. Parallel and perpendicular lines. Parallel lines. Look at the pairs of straight lines shown below. In figure 1, lines PQ and RS intersect at point O. In figure 2, when line PQ is produced towards the point Q and line RS is produced towards S, they intersect at point O. In figures 1 and 2, lines PQ and RS are intersecting lines. In figure 3, Lines PQ and RS on being produced on either side do not intersect. Such lines are called parallel lines. The distance between the parallel lines always remains the same. Thus, parallel lines can be defined as the straight lines which lie in the same plane and do not intersect or meet at any point on being produced on either side. If lines PQ and RS are parallel to each other, we write PQ parallel to RS. The symbol means is parallel to. The opposite edges of a scale, a table, two tracks of a railway line, a blackboard, etc. are physical examples representing parallel lines. Line segments can also be parallel. In the given figure, line segment AB is parallel to line segment CD. Perpendicular lines. Look at the lines PQ and RS shown below. In figure 1, lines PQ and RS intersect at point O to make four angles. In figure 2, lines PQ and RS intersect at point O when produced. They form only one angle. In figure 3, lines PQ produced and RS intersect at O. In this case, two angles are formed. We measure all the angles formed in the three figures. We will find that each of these angles is 90 degree or a right angle. When two lines PQ and RS intersect in such a manner that each of the angles formed is a right angle, they are said to be perpendicular to each other. If lines PQ and RS are perpendicular to each other, we write PQ perpendicular to RS. The adjacent edges of a tabletop or a book.
the adjacent sides of the walls of a room, a telephone pole standing on the pavement are some practical examples of representing perpendicular lines. Angle A figure formed by two rays with the same initial endpoint is called an angle. The common endpoint is called the vertex of the angle and the two rays are called the arms of the angle. Look at the pictures given. They give us some idea of an angle. We use the symbol for the word angle. Naming an angle. We name an angle in three ways using a three letter name in the order of a point on one arm, vertex and a point on the other arm. In the given figure, we name the angle as angle BAC or angle CAB. Using only one letter name, that is the vertex, angle A. This can be used when there is only one angle with this vertex. Writing a number or small letter within the rays of the angle and naming the angle using this number or letter, such as angle 1 or angle A. Remember, the middle letter is always the vertex of the angle. Interior and exterior of an angle. The inside of the angle, that is the region between the ray is called the interior of the angle. In the given figure, point A is in the interior of angle PQR. Points P, D, Q, E and R are on the arms, also called sides of the angle. The points of the plane that do not lie on the arms or in the interior of the angle are in the exterior of the angle. The points X and Y are in the exterior of angle PQR. Example Look at the angle shown in figure given on the right and answer the following questions. Classify point M, N, O, R, S, T, D, a and B, as in the interior of the angle and in exterior of the angle or on the angle. Name the angle in different ways. Write the names of the arms of the angle and its vertex. Solution M, N and D are the points in the interior of the angle. Points R, S and T are in the exterior of the angle. And points A, O and B are on the angle. We may name the angle as angle AOB, angle BOA or angle O. OA and OB are the arms and O is the vertex of the angle. Remember, whenever two rays have a common endpoint, we get an angle. Comparison of angles The size of an angle is measured by how much the arms are opened out and not by how long the arms appear to be. Let us compare angle AOB and angle EFG given below. Method Trace angle EFG on a tracing paper. Place the tracing of angle EFG on angle AOB in such a way that F falls on O and EF falls along OB. We observe that G lies in the interior of angle AOB. So, angle EFG is less than angle AOB. Let us compare angle PQR and angle XYZ given below. Method Trace PQR on a tracing paper. Place the tracing of angle PQR on angle XYZ in such a way that Q falls on Y and QR falls on YZ. We observe that X lies in the exterior of angle PQR. So, angle XYZ is greater than angle PQR. This method of tracing angles to compare them is practically difficult. To overcome this difficulty, we need to measure an angle exactly. Measurement of angles In the measurement of angles, the unit used for measurement is called degree. The symbol for degree is given as, for example, 30 degree, 45 degree, 60 degree, etc. The number of degree in an angle is called its measure. 
In the given figure, the number of degrees in angle AOB is 15 degree. The notation for measure of an angle AOB in degrees such as angle AOB is equal to N, where N is the number representing the measure of the angle. Find the measure of the following angles. Angle AOC, Angle AOD, Angle AOE, Angle AOF, Angle AOG, Angle AOH. How to measure angles? An angle is measured with a protractor. A protractor has two scales of measurements, the inner scale and the outer scale. On both the scales, angles from 0 degree to 180 degree are marked. We read clockwise in the outer and the anticlockwise in the inner. We follow the given steps to measure an angle. Draw an angle of unknown measure with the help of a pencil and ruler. Step 1. Place the protractor in such a way that the center coincides with the vertex O of the angle and the baseline coincides with the arm OA of the angle. Step 2. Check the scale, outer or inner, where the baseline arm points to 0 degree. Step 3. Start reading the measure of the angle from where the other arm crosses the scale. The measure of angle AOB is 50 degree or angle AOB is equal to 50 degree. Example, read the measure of angle PQR and angle EFG in the following figures. Solution, we have angle PQR is equal to 75 degree and angle EFG is equal to 120 degree. Types of angles. Angles are classified into various types according to their measure. Right angle. An angle whose measure is 90 degree is called a right angle. In figures, generally we represent a right angle by the mark. Here, angle AOB is equal to 90 degree is equal to a right angle. Acute angle. An angle whose measure is less than 90 degree but greater than 0 degree is called an acute angle. In the given figure, angle RQP is equal to 40 degree is an acute angle. Obtuse angle. An angle whose measure is between 90 degree and 180 degree is called an obtuse angle. In the figure, angle KLM is equal to 140 degree, which lies between 90 degree and 180 degree. Therefore, it is an obtuse angle. Straight angle. An angle whose measure is 180 degree is called a straight angle. The arms of a straight angle are opposite rays. A straight angle is formed at any point of a straight line by two opposite rays. In the given figure, angle ABC is equal to 180 degree. So, it is a straight angle. Reflex angle. An angle whose measure is between 180 degree and 360 degree is called a reflex angle. We measure a reflex angle with a circular protractor. We can also measure or construct a reflex angle by using a semicircular protractor. This is done in two parts. First of all, a straight angle 180 degree point is marked. Then by putting the baseline of the protractor along 180 degree, mark the other part. In the given figure, angle POQ is equal to 240 degree. So it is a reflex angle. Complete angle. When the initial and terminal positions of an angle coincide, the measure of the angle is called a complete angle. A complete angle is made up of two straight angles. Therefore, one complete angle is equal to two straight angles is equal to 2 into 180 degree is equal to 360 degree.
Also, we can write one complete angle is equal to four right angles. How to draw angles? We use a protractor to measure angles. We also use it to draw angles of given measurements. Look at these examples. Example one: Draw an angle of forty degree using a ruler and a protractor. Solution: To draw an angle of forty degree, we proceed as per the following steps. Step one: Draw a ray, say OQ, with the endpoint F on a sheet of paper. Step two: Place the protractor in such a way that its center point lies on O. And its baseline lies along OQ. Step three: Run your eyes along the scale whose zero degree mark lies on OQ until you find the forty degree mark on the rim. Step four: On that mark, put a dot with a fine pencil and name it P as shown in Figure one. Step five: Remove the protractor and draw a ray OP as shown in Figure two. Thus, angle POQ is equal to 40 degree. Is the required angle? Example two: Draw an angle of 130 degree using a ruler and a protractor. Solution: To draw an angle of 130 degree, we proceed as per the following steps. Step one: Draw a ray, say FE, with the endpoint F on a sheet of paper. Step two. Place the protractor in such a way that its center point lies on F and its baseline lies along FE. Step three: Run your eyes along the scale whose zero degree mark lies on FE until you find 130 degree mark on the rim. Step four: On that mark, put a dot with a fine pencil and name it G as shown in Figure one. Step five. Remove the protractor and draw a ray FG as shown in Figure two. Thus, angle EFG is equal to 130 degree is a required angle. Chapter two: Shapes and Patterns. Geometry is commonly found in architecture, bridges, buildings, towers, space stations, etc. Have triangles as a part of their construction. Triangles hold the shape of these constructions very well and are fixed. We have already learned about closed figures and polygons in the previous class. Let us revise. A polygon is a simple closed figure. Made up of line segments. Look at some examples of polygons shown below. A polygon with three sides in the figures given above is a triangle. Physical examples of triangles in our surroundings are: In mathematics, a triangle is defined as follows: A triangle is a simple closed plane figure formed by three line segments. In the figure, A B C is a triangle. A, B, and C are its vertices. A, B, B, C, and C, A are its sides. Angle A, B, C, angle B, C, A, and angle C, A, B are its angles. Thus, a triangle has three vertices, three sides, and three angles. We use the symbol triangle to denote a triangle. Thus, triangle A, B, C means Triangle ABC. This triangle can also be written as triangle BCA, triangle BAC, triangle ACB, triangle CAB, and triangle CBA. Thus, the order of vertices does not matter while describing a triangle. Classification of triangles. Triangles are classified in two ways: on the basis of sides. And on the basis of angles, classification on the basis of sides. Scalene triangle, a triangle in which all the three sides are unequal in length, is called a scalene triangle. In the given figure, 
PQR is a scalene triangle because all the three sides PQ, QR and RP are unequal. Isoscales triangle. A triangle in which two sides are equal in length is called an isoscales triangle. In the given figure, MNO is an isoscales triangle because the two sides MN and MO are equal. Equilateral triangle. A triangle in which all the three sides are equal in length is called an equilateral triangle. In the given figure, ABC is an equilateral triangle because all the three sides AB, BC and CA are equal. Classification on the basis of angles. Right angled triangle. A triangle in which one angle is right angle that is equal to 90 degree is called a right angled triangle. In the given figure, PQR is a right angled triangle because angle Q is equal to 90 degree. The side opposite to the right angle is known as the hypotenuse of the triangle and the other two sides are called the legs of the triangle. PR is the hypotenuse and PQ and QR are the legs. Acute angle triangle. A triangle in which each of the three angles is acute, that is less than 90 degree, right angle is called an acute angled triangle. In the given figure, angle K, angle L and angle M are acute angles. So, KLM is an acute angled triangle. Obtuse angled triangle. A triangle in which one angle is obtuse, that is more than 90 degree, right angle is called an obtuse angled triangle. In the given figure, PQR is an obtuse angled triangle because angle Q is an obtuse angle. Remember, in an isoscales triangle, two angles are equal. An equilateral triangle is an acute angled triangle and the measure of its each angle is 60 degree. Two angles in each case of right angled and obtuse angled triangles are acute. Properties of a triangle. Property 1. The sum of the lengths of, the, of any two sides of a triangle is always greater than the length of the third side. Verification. Observe the triangles shown below. Measure their sides and fill in the table given below. Now complete the table given below. Conclusion. We conclude that the sum of the lengths of any two sides of a triangle is greater than the third side. Thus, three line segments can form a triangle only when the sum of the lengths of two smaller line segments is greater than the length of the lowest one. Note. The above result is clearly true when the sum of the lengths of two smaller sides is greater than the length of the longest side. Property 2. The sum of the measures of all the three angles of a triangle is 180 degree or two right angles. Verification. Draw a triangle PQR on a piece of thin cardboard and cut it out. Now label the three corners as one 2 and 3 and snip off the three corners of the triangle. With the help of the points you have marked, arrange the piece as shown on the next page. At the point Q, where angle P, angle Q and angle R are placed together, the three angles together measure 180 degree. So, angle 1 plus angle 2 plus angle 3 is equal to 180 degree. Thus, we conclude that the sum of three angles of a triangle is 180 degree or two right angles 2 into 90 degree. Example 1. Is it possible to form a triangle whose sides are 5 cm, 8 cm and 14 cm long? Solution. Let us consider three line segments of lengths 5 cm, 8 cm and 14 cm. The sum of the lengths of two smaller line segments is equal to 5 cm plus 8 cm is equal to 13 cm. 
the length of the longest line segment is equal to 14 cm. Clearly, the sum of the lengths of two smaller line segments is not greater than the length of the longest line segment. So, it is not possible to form a triangle by the three line segments of lengths 5 cm, 8 cm and 14 cm. Example 2. Which of the following sets of angles represent the angles of a triangle? A. 70 degree, 80 degree, 50 degree. B. 35 degree, 40 degree, 100 degree. C. 45 degree, 65 degree, 70 degree. Solution. A. Since the sum of three angles is equal to 70 degree plus 80 degree plus 50 degree, is equal to 200 degree. Since 210 degree is greater than 180 degree, this set does not represent the angles of a triangle. B. Since the sum of three angles is equal to 35 degree plus 40 degree plus 100 degree is equal to 175 degree. Since 175 degree is less than 180 degree. This set does not represent the angles of a triangle. C. Since the sum of three angles is equal to 45 degree plus 65 degree plus 70 degree is equal to 180 degree. So, this set represents the angles of a triangle. Example 3. The two angles of a triangle, triangle XYZ, are given as angle Y is equal to 60 degree and angle Z is equal to 75 degree. Find the third angle. Solution. We know that the sum of three angles of triangles is 180 degree. So, angle X plus angle Y plus angle Z is equal to 180 degree or angle X plus 60 degree plus 75 degree is equal to 180 degree or angle X plus 135 degree is equal to 180 degree. Therefore, angle X is equal to 180 degree minus 135 degree is equal to 45 degree. Circles A circle is a simple closed curve drawn in such a way that every point in it is at an equal distance from a fixed point lying inside it. The fixed point is called the center of the circle. In the figure alongside, O is the center of the circle. Terms related to a circle. Radius. A line segment drawn from the center to any point on the circle is called a radius of the circle. In the figure given below, the line segment OP is a radius of the circle. The line segments OA and OB are also the radii of the circle. Diameter. The line segment which passes through the center of the circle and whose endpoints lie on the circle is called the diameter of the circle. The line segment AB is a diameter of the circle. Just as we can draw an infinite number of radii through the center of a circle, we can draw an infinite number of diameters. Relation between radius and diameter. The length of a diameter of a circle is twice the length of its radius. That is, diameter is equal to 2 into radius or radius is equal to diameter divided by 2. Chord. A line segment that joins two given points in a circle is called chord of the circle. In the given figure, line segments PQ and AB are chords of the circle. Clearly, diameter is the longest chord of the circle. Circumference The length of a circle, distance around, is called the circumference of the circle. Interior and exterior of a circle the portion enclosed inside a circle is called the interior of the circle. Points A, O, N and Q lie in the interior of the circle. The portion outside the circle is called the exterior of the circle. Points P, M and B 
lie in the exterior of the circle. The points T, R, L and C are said to lie on the circle. It is also called the boundary of the circle. Example 1. Find the diameter of a circle whose radius is 7.4 cm. Solution. We have radius is equal to 7.4 cm. Diameter is equal to 2 into radius is equal to 2 into 7.4 cm is equal to 14.8 cm. Hence, the diameter of the given circle is 14.8 cm. Example 2. Find the radius of a circle whose diameter is 16.8 cm. Solution. Given that diameter is equal to 16.8 cm. So, radius is equal to diameter divided by 2 is equal to 16.8 divided by 2 cm is equal to 8.4 cm. Hence, the radius of the given circle is 8.4 cm. Construction of a circle with given radius. Let us draw a circle of radius 3.2 cm. To draw the circle of a given measure, here 3.2 cm, we take the following steps. Step 1. Fix a sharp pencil firmly in the pencil holding arm of the compasses. If needed, tighten the pencil with the help of the screw. Step 2. Open the compass so that its needle-like arm, point and the pencil tip are 3.2 cm apart. Step 3. Mark a point, say O, on the sheet of a paper. Step 4. Place the point of the needle, like arm, of the compass at O and move the pencil point around by holding the compass from the top until the complete circle is drawn. Step 5. Lift the compass. We get a circle of the given radius 3.2 cm. How to measure the circumference of a circle? We know that the circumference is the length of a circle and cannot be measured with a scale. A string can be used to measure the circumference of the circle. Steps Mark off a point on the circumference. Keep one end of the string at that point. Take the string round the circle till you come back to the point. Measure the length of the string using the scale. This gives you the approximate measurement of the circumference. Relationship between the diameter and the circumference. Use a scale and string to find the diameter and circumference of these circles. You will observe that the circumference is a little more than three times the length of the diameter or circumference is nearly about three into diameter or C is nearly about three into D. Here C stands for circumference and D stands for diameter. Note, the symbol means approximately equal to. Example 1. Find the circumference, approx, of a circle whose diameter is 10 cm. Solution. Circumference is equal to 3 into diameter. Approx is equal to 3 into 10 cm is equal to 30 cm. Approx. Symmetry. Symmetry exists all around us. A flower, a butterfly, star, etc. show symmetry. We can call a shape as symmetrical when one half of it is the mirror image of the other half. For example, this picture shows symmetry. The line of symmetry divides a shape into two equal mirror images. Line of symmetry. Symmetry is of two main types. Rotation and Reflection. Reflection and rotation. There are mainly three ways for moving a figure from one place to the other in a plane without changing the shape or size of the figure. Slide or translate a figure. Reflect a figure across a mirror line. Rotate a figure around a point. Reflection symmetry. 
Reflection means seeing the image of something in a mirror. If you stand in front of a mirror, the mirror image is the reverse image of yours. Right becomes left and left becomes right in a mirror image. Similarly, reflection in geometry is flipping a figure across a line such that it appears to be the mirror image or reflection of the original object. Each point in the reflected figure mirror image is at the same distance from the line as the corresponding point in the original object. The line is called the mirror line or line of symmetry or line of reflection. Look at the following reflection. M-O-N is the reflection of triangle M-O-N in the given line. As can be seen, the distances of points M-O-N dash, dash, and N- dash from the mirror line are the same as the distances of points M, O and N respectively from the mirror line. Some examples of reflection are given. Rotational symmetry. Rotation means turning. In geometry, rotating a figure means turning a figure about a given point known as the point of rotation. This point can be on the figure or any other point. Look at some examples of rotation from real life situations. Ceiling fan, steering wheel of a vehicle, knob of a door, rotation of the hands of a clock about the point where they meet, rotation of a 2D shape. We can also rotate 2D shapes or plane shapes about a point. The three things that are needed to describe a rotation are the direction of rotation, clockwise or anti-clockwise, the angle of rotation, the point of rotation. The example given here is of the rotation of a squared box about a given point. One quarter turn. Shape A is rotated through an angle of 90 degree about the point O in the clockwise direction to get shape B. Half turn. Shape B is further rotated through an angle of 90 degree about the same point O in the clockwise direction to get shape C. This is the same as if we would rotate shape A through an angle of 180 degree about point O in clockwise direction to get shape C. Three quarter turn. Shape C is again rotated by an angle of 90 degree about point O to get shape D. What happens when shape D is further rotated through an angle of 90 degree about point O? In clockwise direction, we observe that the squared box comes back to its initial position as it has rotated 360 degree, one complete rotation. Some more examples are given figures are rotated about point P through an angle of 180 degree in the clockwise direction. When letter N turns through an angle of 90 degree about the point of rotation A in a clockwise direction, then it becomes letter Z. Symmetry in solids. Symmetry is the exact likeness in a shape about a given line, point or plane. In the previous class, we have already learned that Plane shapes are figures which can be folded over in such a way that the two parts match exactly are called symmetrical figures and the fold line is called the line of symmetry. Symmetrical figure can have one or more than one line of symmetry. Solids also show symmetry. Some solids can be cut into halves so that both the halves are identical. The plane surface along which the solid is cut to give identical halves is called the plane of symmetry. If we put a mirror in front of each half, then each half is a reflection or mirror image of other. Like 2D shapes, solids can also have more than one plane of symmetry. You will learn about this in higher classes. Symmetry in some common symmetrical 3D figures. Consider a cylinder. The two drawn lines are the lines of symmetry. The two drawn lines are the lines of symmetry for a cylinder. The drawn line is the line of symmetry for a cone. Chapter 3 Perimeter and Area 
In the previous class, we learnt about perimeter of a rectilinear figure. Let us revise the same. A plane figure bounded by line segments is called a rectilinear figure. Thus, each one of the figures like a triangle, a square, a rectangle, a quadrilateral etc. are rectilinear figures. The length of boundary of any rectilinear figure is called its perimeter. Thus, we add the measure of all the sides to get the perimeter. Perimeter using formula. We can calculate perimeter or some polygons by using a formula. Here, we shall learn to calculate the perimeter of a rectangle and square by using formula. Perimeter of a rectangle. A rectangle is a plane figure whose opposite sides facing each other are of equal length. So, we have two equal lengths and two equal breadths. Perimeter of a rectangle is equal to length plus breadth plus length plus breadth is equal to length plus length plus breadth plus breadth is equal to 2 into length plus 2 into breadth is equal to 2 into length plus breadth or P is equal to 2 into L plus B. From the above formula, we have L plus B is equal to 1 upon 2 into P or L is equal to P upon 2 minus B and B is equal to P upon 2 minus L. Example 1. The length and breadth of a rectangle are 38 centimeter and 27 centimeter respectively. Find its perimeter. Solution. We have L is equal to 38 centimeter and B is equal to 27 centimeter. P is equal to 2 into L plus B is equal to 2 into 38 plus 27 centimeter is equal to 2 into 65 centimeter is equal to 130 centimeter. Example 2. The breadth of a rectangle is 12 cm. Its length is twice its breadth. What will be the perimeter of the rectangle? Solution. We have breadth of the rectangle B is equal to 12 cm. Length of the rectangle L is equal to 2 into 12 cm is equal to 24 cm. Now perimeter of the rectangle is equal to 2 into L plus B is equal to 2 into 24 centimeter plus 12 centimeter is equal to 2 into 36 centimeter is equal to 72 centimeter. Thus, the perimeter of the rectangle is 72 centimeter. Example 3. The perimeter of a rectangle is 70 decimeter. Find its length if breadth is 15 decimeter. Solution. Perimeter P is equal to 70 decimeter. Breadth B is equal to 15 decimeter. Therefore, length is equal to P upon 2 minus B is equal to 70 upon 2 minus 15 decimeter is equal to 35 minus 15 decimeter is equal to 20 decimeter. Hence, length of the rectangle is 20 decimeter. Example 4. The length of a rectangular park is 0 0.1 kilometer and its breadth is 80 meter. Find the perimeter of the park in meters. Three rounds of barbed wire are needed to fence this park. Find the cost of fencing the park if the barbed wire costs 6 rupees 50 paise per meter. Solution. We have length is equal to 0 0.1 kilometer. Breadth is equal to 80 meter. As the perimeter is required in meters, we convert length into meters. So, length is equal to 0 0.1 kilometer is equal to 0 0.1 into 1000 meter is equal to 100 meter. Perimeter of the park is equal to 2 into L plus B is equal to 2 into 100 meter plus 80 meter is equal to 2 into 180 meter is equal to 360 meter. Length of barbed wire needed is equal to 
थ्री राउंड ऑफ द पार्क इज इक्वल टू थ्री इंटू थ्री हंड्रेड एंड सिक्सटी मीटर इज इक्वल टू वन थाउजेंड एटी मीटर कॉस्ट ऑफ वन मीटर इज इक्वल टू सिक्स रूपीज फिफ्टी पैसे हेंस कॉस्ट ऑफ वन थाउजेंड एटी मीटर ऑफ बाब्ड वायर इज इक्वल टू सिक्स रूपीज फिफ्टी पैसे इंटू वन थाउजेंड एटी इज इक्वल टू सेवन थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी रूपीज फर्स्ट एक्सप्रेस द गिवन लेंथ इन द सेम यूनिट नेवर कैलकुलेट विद डिफरेंट यूनिट पेरीमीटर ऑफ अ स्क्वायर अ स्क्वायर इज अ प्लेन फिगर हुज ऑल फोर साइड आर ऑफ इक्वल लेंथ पेरीमीटर ऑफ अ स्क्वायर इज इक्वल टू साइड प्लस साइड प्लस साइड प्लस साइड इज इक्वल टू फोर इंटू साइड और पी इज इक्वल टू फोर इंटू एस हेंस एस इज इक्वल टू पी अपॉन फोर एग्जाम्पल वन Find the perimeter of a squared science book of side twenty one centimeter. Solution: Perimeter of the book is equal to four into side is equal to four into twenty one centimeter is equal to eighty four centimeter. Example two: The length of fencing of a square garden is seven hundred meter. Find the side of the garden. Solution. Perimeter of the square garden is equal to seven hundred meter. Length of one side of the field is equal to p upon four. Is equal to seven hundred upon four meter. Is equal to one hundred seventy five meter. Area. We have learned that perimeter is the length of boundary of the figure. What can we say about the surface covered by a figure? The amount of surface covered by a figure is called the area of the figure. Just as we need a standard unit for the measurement of length, similarly we need a standard unit for the measurement of area. A square of side one unit, like one centimeter or one meter, is used as a standard unit of area. Look at the square of side one centimeter given on the right. We say that the area of this square is one square centimeter, which is written as one square centimeter or one centimeter square. Area is always measured in square units. The figure given alongside shows a rectangle of length four centimeter and breadth three centimeter. Observe that the rectangle is divided into a number of squares of side one centimeter. Clearly. The rectangle has been covered with twelve such squares. We say that the area of the rectangle is twelve. Units used for the measurement of area. Small surfaces are measured in square centimeters or centimeter square. For example, surface area of a notebook. Larger surfaces are measured in square meters or meter square. For example, surface area of a garden or field. Still larger surfaces are measured in square kilometers or kilometer square. For example, surface area of a state, country, etc. It is not always possible to measure areas by counting squares. To find areas in such cases, formulae are used. Formula for measuring area of a rectangle: draw a rectangle ABCD and divide it into number of squares. Consider the area of each square as one square centimeter. Area of the rectangle is equal to number of unit squares in the rectangle. The area of rectangle ABCD is equal to fifteen square centimeter. If we observe, we will find Number of squares along the length is equal to five. Number of squares along the breadth is equal to three. If we multiply the two, we will get five into three is equal to fifteen square centimeter. Area of rectangle is equal to length into breadth, or A is equal to L into B, where A is area, L and B are length and breadth of rectangle respectively. Using the above relation, we can also write length of the rectangle L is equal to 
area of the rectangle upon breadth is equal to area divided by breadth is equal to a upon b and breadth of the rectangle b is equal to area of the rectangle upon length is equal to area divided by length is equal to a upon l example 1 Find the area of a rectangle whose length is 18 cm and breadth is 16 cm. Solution. Length of the rectangle is equal to 18 cm. Breadth of the rectangle is equal to 16 cm. So, area is equal to length into breadth is equal to 18 cm into 16 cm is equal to 288 cm centimeter square example 2 find the length of the rectangular park whose area is 391 square meter and length is 23 meter solution area of the park is equal to 391 square meter length of the park is equal to 23 meter we know that a is equal to l into b hence b is equal to a upon l is equal to 391 upon 23 is equal to 17 meter. Hence, the breadth of the park is 17 meter. Example 3. The perimeter of a rectangle is 48 centimeter. If its length is 14 centimeter, find its area. Solution. We have perimeter P is equal to 48 centimeter and length L is equal to 14 centimeter. Therefore, Breadth B is equal to P upon 2 minus L is equal to 48 upon 2 minus 14 centimeter is equal to 24 minus 14 centimeter is equal to 10 centimeter. Therefore, area A is equal to L into B is equal to 14 into 10 centimeter square is equal to 140 centimeter square. Hence, the area of the rectangle is 140 square centimeter. Example 4. The area of a rectangular field is 8160 square meter. If its length is 120 meter, find its breadth and its perimeter. Solution. Area of the rectangular field is equal to 8160 square meter. Length L of the field is equal to 120 meter its breadth b is equal to area upon length is equal to 8160 upon 120 meter is equal to 68 meter perimeter of a rectangle is equal to 2 into l plus b is equal to 2 into 120 meter plus 68 meter is equal to 2 into 188 meter is equal to 376 meter. Therefore, perimeter of the given rectangular field is 376 meter. Formula for measuring area of a square. We know that a square is a special kind of rectangle whose length and breadth are equal. So, area of a square is equal to length into length or symbolically A is equal to L into L. The length and breadth of a square are called its sides. So, area of a square is equal to side into side. Example 1. Find the area of a square of side 15 meter. Solution. Side of the square is equal to 15 meter. So, area of the square is equal to side into side is equal to 15 meter into 15 meter is equal to 225 square meter example 2 the area of a square is 81 square centimeter find the side of the square solution area is equal to side into side here area is equal to 81 square centimeter so 81 is equal to side into side think of a number which when multiplied by itself gives 81 clearly 9 into 9 is equal to 81. Therefore, side of the square is equal to 9 centimeter. Example 3. Find the area of a square whose perimeter is 68 centimeter. 
सोल्यूशन पेरीमीटर ऑफ द स्क्वायर इज इक्वल टू सिक्सटी एट सेंटीमीटर देर फोर साइट ऑफ द स्क्वायर इज इक्वल टू सिक्सटी एट डिवाइडेड बाई फोर सेंटीमीटर इज इक्वल टू सेवनटीन सेंटीमीटर देर फोर एरिया ऑफ द स्क्वायर इज इक्वल टू साइड इन टू साइड इज इक्वल टू सेवनटीन इन टू सेवनटीन स्क्वायर सेंटीमीटर इज इक्वल टू टू हंड्रेड एटी नाइन स्क्वायर सेंटीमीटर हेंस द एरिया ऑफ द स्क्वायर इज टू हंड्रेड एटी नाइन स्क्वायर सेंटीमीटर चैप्टर फोर वॉल्यूम द वॉल्यूम ऑफ एन ऑब्जेक्ट इज द मेजर ऑफ अमाउंट ऑफ स्पेस इट ऑक्यूपाइज सॉलिड फिगर्स लाइक क्यूब्स क्यूबॉइड्स सिलेंडर्स कोन्स एंड स्पीयर्स ऑक्यूपाई स्पेस एंड हेंस हैव वॉल्यूम इन द प्रीवियस क्लास वी हैव लर्न दैट स्टैंडर्ड यूनिट्स आर रिक्वायर्ड फॉर द मेजरमेंट ऑफ एरिया सिमिलरली फॉर वॉल्यूम ऑल्सो अ स्टैंडर्ड यूनिट इज रिक्वायर्ड A cube of side one unit, like one millimeter, one centimeter, or one meter, is used as the standard unit of volume. The cubes of length one millimeter, one centimeter, and one meter are shown above. Their volumes are one cubic millimeter, one cubic centimeter, and one cubic meter, respectively. We can find the volume of a solid by fitting in unit cubes in the solid. and counting them remember volume is always measured in cubic units we use a cube to measure volume because it is the only three dimensional measure which can fill all available space without leaving any empty space for example volume of figure a is 8 cubic centimeter and that of figure b is 9 cubic centimeter units used for the measurement of volume For very small containers, we use cubes of side one millimeter. The measurement of volume of such a cube is written as one cubic millimeter or one millimeter cube. For small containers, we use cubes of side one centimeter. The measurement of volume of such a cube is written as one cubic centimeter or one centimeter cube. For big containers. We use cubes of side one meter. The measurement of volume of such a cube is written as one cubic meter or one meter cube. Consider a box whose length is five centimeter, breadth is three centimeter, and the height is two centimeter. Let us fill one centimeter cube unit cubes in it. We find that thirty such cubes will fit into the box completely. So we say that the volume of the box is thirty cubic centimeter, but number of cubes along length of the box is equal to five. Number of cubes along breadth of the box is equal to three, and number of cubes along the height of the box is equal to two. We have five into three into two is equal to thirty. Thus, volume of cuboid is equal to length. Into breadth, into height. We call the length, breadth, and height of the cuboid as its dimensions. Example one: Find the volume of a cuboid whose length, breadth, and height are sixteen centimeter, twelve centimeter, and nine centimeter, respectively. Solution: Length of the cuboid is equal to sixteen centimeter. Breadth of the cuboid is equal to twelve centimeter. Height of the cuboid is equal to nine centimeter. Volume of the cuboid is equal to length into breadth into height is equal to sixteen into twelve into nine centimeter cube is equal to seventeen hundred twenty eight centimeter cube. Example two: The length and breadth of a cuboid are eight centimeter and six centimeter respectively. If the volume of the cuboid is two hundred and forty cubic centimeter, find the height of the cuboid. Solution: Volume is equal to length into breadth into height. Two hundred forty is equal to eight into six into height. Two hundred forty is equal to forty-eight into height. Height is equal to 
240 divided by 48 is equal to 5 cm while finding the volume the length breadth and height should be expressed in the same unit example 3 a cuboidal box is 8 cm long 3 cm broad and 6 cm high how many such boxes can be packed in a carton of length 1 m breadth 72 cm and height 43 cm solution volume of one cuboidal box is equal to length into breadth into height is equal to 8 cm into 3 cm into 6 cm is equal to 8 into 3 into 6 cubic cm volume of the carton is equal to l into b into h is equal to 1 m into 72 cm into 43 cm is equal to 100 cm into 72 cm into 43 cm since 1 m is equal to 100 cm is equal to 100 into 72 into 43 Centimeter cube. Therefore, number of boxes that can be packed is equal to volume of the carton upon volume of one box is equal to hundred into seventy two into forty three centimeter cube upon eight into three into six centimeter cube is equal to fifty into forty three is equal to twenty one hundred fifty volume of a cube. We know that a cube is a cuboid with length is equal to breadth is equal to height. So volume of a cube is equal to length into length into length. Example one. Find the volume of a cube whose side measures twelve centimeter. Solution: Length of each side of the cube is equal to twelve centimeter. Volume of the cube is equal to side into side into side is equal to 12 into 12 into 12 cubic centimeter is equal to 1728 centimeter cube example 2 a cubical box has a volume of 512 cubic centimeter what could be the measure of its side solution volume of a cube is equal to side into side into side 512 is equal to side into side into side we have to think of a number which when multiplied by itself 3 times gives 512 we get 8 into 8 into 8 is equal to 512 the side of the cube is 8 cm example 3 a cubical oil tank has each of its edge as 2 m find the quantity of oil it can occupy solution to measure capacity we use standard unit as liter where 1 cubic decimeter is equal to 1 liter because 1 decimeter is equal to 10 cm so 1 decimeter into 1 decimeter into 1 decimeter is equal to 1 liter 10 cm into 10 cm Into ten centimeter is equal to one thousand milliliter. One thousand cubic centimeter is equal to one thousand milliliter. So one centimeter cube is equal to one milliliter. Now the tank is cubical and its edge is equal to two meter. So volume capacity of the oil tank is equal to two meter into two meter into two meter is equal to Eight cubic meter. Now one cubic meter is equal to one meter into one meter into one meter is equal to ten decimeter into ten decimeter into ten decimeter is equal to one thousand cubic decimeter is equal to one thousand liters because one cubic decimeter is equal to one liter. Hence, capacity of the oil tank is equal to. Eight into one thousand liters is equal to eight thousand liters. Chapter five: Number patterns.
We have learned different patterns in addition, subtraction and multiplication of numbers in the previous class. In this chapter, we shall learn about square and triangular numbers and their properties. We shall also learn about different types of border patterns which rise by reflecting or rotating a geometrical figure or an English alphabet. Square Numbers When we multiply a number by itself, we get the square of the number. For example, 1 into 1 is equal to 1 square is equal to 1. 2 into 2 is equal to 2 square is equal to 4. 3 into 3 is equal to 3 square is equal to 9. 4 into 4 is equal to 4 square is equal to 16, etc. The numbers 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, etc. are called square numbers. We can arrange a square number in a square pattern. The dot patterns of the first five square numbers are shown below. 1 into 1 is equal to 1. 2 into 2 is equal to 4. 3 into 3 is equal to 9. 4 into 4 is equal to 16. 5 into 5 is equal to 25. Properties of square numbers Square numbers have various properties. Let us know some of them. First square number is equal to 1 is equal to 1. The first odd number. Second square number is equal to 4 is equal to 1 plus 3. The sum of first two odd numbers. Third square number is equal to 9 is equal to 1 plus 3 plus 5. The sum of first three odd numbers. Fourth square number is equal to 16. 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7. The sum of first four odd numbers. Following the above pattern, we can find the nth square number as the sum of first n odd numbers. We add the consecutive odd numbers to the previous square number to obtain the series of square numbers. 1 is equal to 1 is equal to 1 into 1. 1 plus 3 is equal to 4 is equal to 2 into 2. 4 plus 5 is equal to 9 is equal to 3 into 3. 9 plus 7 is equal to 16 is equal to 4 into 4. 16 plus 9 is equal to 25 is equal to 5 into 5. And so on. The difference of two consecutive square number will be an odd number. 2 into 2 minus 1 into 1 is equal to 2 into 1 plus 1 is equal to 3. 3 into 3 minus 2 into 2 is equal to 2 into 2 plus 1 is equal to 5. 4 into 4 minus 3 into 3 is equal to 2 into 3 plus 1 is equal to 7. 5 into 5 minus 4 into 4 is equal to 2 into 4 plus 1 is equal to 9. 6 into 6 minus 5 into 5 is equal to 2 into 5 plus 1 is equal to 11. These patterns can be expanded further. Look at the another pattern. This also gives an odd number. 2 into 2 minus 1 into 1 is equal to 2 into 2 minus 1 is equal to 3. 3 into 3 minus 2 into 2 is equal to 2 into 3 minus 1 is equal to 5. 4 into 4 minus 3 into 3 is equal to 2 into 4 minus 1 is equal to 7. 5 into 5 minus 4 into 4 is equal to 2 into 5 minus 1 is equal to 9. 6 into 6 minus 5 into 5 is equal to 2 into 6 minus 1 is equal to 11. Triangular numbers. The numbers that can be arranged in a triangular pattern are called triangular numbers. The numbers shown below can be represented by dots in the form of a triangle. 
we see that 3, 6, 10 and 15 number of dots can be arranged to form a triangle. Thus, the numbers 3, 6, 10, 15 are called triangular numbers. The first 10 triangular numbers are 1, 3, 6, 10, 15, 21, 28, 36, 45 and 55. We see that 1 is the first triangular number. We can arrange it in a triangle in the way given on the right. From the above discussion, we may define triangular numbers as follows. Triangular numbers are those numbers that can be formed by counting the number of objects used in making a triangle. Properties of a triangular numbers. First triangular number is equal to 1. Second triangular number is equal to 3. Is equal to first triangular number plus 2. Third triangular number is equal to 6. Is equal to second triangular number plus 3. Fourth triangular number is equal to 10. Is equal to third triangular number plus 4. Fifth triangular number is equal to 15. Is equal to fourth triangular number plus 5. Adding two consecutive triangular numbers gives a square number. 1 plus 3 is equal to 4. 6 plus 3 is equal to 9. 10 plus 6 is equal to 16. 15 plus 10 is equal to 25. 3 is the only triangular number which is also a prime number. First triangular number is equal to 1 into 2 upon 2. Second triangular number is equal to 2 into 3 upon 2. Third triangular number is equal to 3 into 4 upon 2. Fourth triangular number is equal to 4 into 5 upon 2. And so on, up to nth triangular number is equal to n into n plus 1 upon 2. Try to find 11th triangular number. Multiply each triangular number by 9 and add 1 to the product as shown below. 1 into 9 plus 1 is equal to 9 plus 1 is equal to 10. 3 into 9 plus 1 is equal to 27 plus 1 is equal to 28. 6 into 9 plus 1 is equal to 54 plus 1 is equal to 55. We observe that the sum of 9 times the product of any triangular number and 1 is a triangular number. Border Patterns We know about reflection and rotation. In this section, we shall use reflections and rotations of English letters and geometrical figures to make border patterns. We see the border patterns in carpets, towels, quilts, saris, floors, etc., enhancing their original beauty. Borders are used to complement a layout, towel, carpets, sari, quilts. These border patterns are formed by repeating a certain shape or unit in one direction, following a basic symmetry, which may be translation, vertical reflection, or horizontal reflection, and rotation. For better understanding, let us take an example. Consider the letter F as the basic unit or shape in the border pattern. We can generate the following patterns when F follows the different symmetries as translation, horizontal reflection, vertical reflection, rotation. Look at another example by taking different things as the unit shape. Translation, horizontal reflection, vertical reflection, rotation. Patterns formed by turning the shapes, quarter turn. 1 upon 4. Let us take this clock and given it clockwise 1 upon 4 or quarter turn. Original positions. After 1 upon 4 turn. After 1 upon 4 turn. After 1 upon 4 turn. And then after 1 upon 4 turn, it will come back to its original position. Original position. 
rotating alphabet E and geometrical black, anti-clockwise by quarter, one upon four turn, we get patterns as shown below. A block will take four, quarter, one upon four turns to come back to its original position, half, one upon two turn. We can also give a block a clockwise half, one upon two turn. You can see that in each case the block turns upside down. We see that a block will take two, half, one upon two turns to come back to its original position. One third, one upon three turn. We can also give a shape clockwise one third, one upon three turn. Tiling Patterns A tiling pattern is formed by the repetition of a single unit or shape that, when repeated, fills the plane with no gaps and no overlaps. The common examples of tiling are the patterns by pairing bricks and the cross-section of beehives. This wall is built using bricks of the same shape and size. The bricks fit together to form a repeated pattern. Look at some more examples of tiling patterns. Can you identify the unit shape in each of these tiling patterns? Here is the unit shape used to make the tiling pattern in figure 1. Here is the unit shape used to make the tiling pattern. Are the patterns given below the tiling patterns? If not, give the reason. The unit shape is overlapping. There are gaps in between. We see tiling patterns in many things around us. Carpets, floor tiles, window panes. Chapter 6 Data Handling In the previous class, we have learned about pictographs and bar graphs. In this chapter, we shall learn about the collection of data and its representation in the form of bar graphs. Look at the data collected by a student of class 5th regarding the height in centimeter of his 25 classmates 91, 92, 90, 88, 94, 96, 86, 92, 84, 88, 86, 86, 96, 86, 83, 92, 86, 92, 88, 90, 94, 83, 92, 89, 99. Data shown in this form is called raw data. From this type of data, we cannot easily make out any assessment about the standards of the class at a glance. It will not be easy for us to answer these questions quickly. The height of how many students is 86 cm? The height of how many students is more than 95 cm? What is the height of the maximum number of students? If we represent the same data in a particular order, say in ascending order, then we get the data as given below. 82, 83, 84, 86, 86, 86, 86, 86, 88, 88, 88, 89, 90, 90, 91, 92, 92, 92, 92, 94, 94, 94, 96, 96, 99. Data represented in this form gives us a better idea. Arranging data in ascending or descending order is called an array. Now you can answer the questions easily. The height of 5 students is 86 cm. The height of 10 students is more than 91 cm. The height of the maximum number of students is 86 cm. When the same data is represented in a grouped form in a table, we have Data presented in this form as shown on the previous page is called a tabular form and it gives a good idea to onlookers. Representation of data in the form of frequency table Marks obtained by 21 students of class 5th in a monthly test in maths out of 100 are given below. 75, 80 75, 70, 75, 78, 85, 62, 78, 85, 80, 80, 62, 90, 62, 75, 75, 
एटी फाइव एटी सेवेंटी सेवेंटी फाइव अरेन्जिंग द गिवन मार्क्स इन असेंडिंग ऑर्डर वी हैव सिक्सटी टू सिक्सटी टू सिक्सटी टू थ्री टाइम्स सेवेंटी सेवेंटी टू टाइम्स सेवेंटी फाइव सेवेंटी फाइव सेवेंटी फाइव सेवेंटी फाइव सेवेंटी फाइव सेवेंटी फाइव सिक्स टाइम्स सेवेंटी एट सेवेंटी एट टू टाइम्स एटी 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 फोर टाइम्स एटी फाइव एटी फाइव एटी फाइव थ्री टाइम्स नाइन्टी वन टाइम From the above arrangement, we find the number of times a particular mark repeatedly occurs. This is called frequency of the mark. The table showing the marks and their corresponding frequencies is called a frequency table. Thus, the above data can be arranged in the frequency table as given below. Each time an entry is made in the data, we put a tally mark for each mark in the tally marks column. One stroke is put for each tally mark, and up to four, we put. The fifth tally mark is represented as. After making tally marks for all the values, the frequency of each value is written in the next column. The frequency shows the number of times a value occurs in the data. After the data has been tabulated, we can draw a pictograph or a bar graph as shown. Pictograph. Here, one picture represents one student. Bar graph. How to read a bar graph? Example: In a survey of sixty families of a colony, the number of members in each family was recorded, and the data has been represented by the bar graph as shown. Read the bar graph carefully and answer the following questions: What does the bar graph depict? How many families have four members? How many people live alone? How many families have more than two members? Which type of family is the most common? How many members are there in each family of this kind? Solution: A. The number of members in a family. B. Twenty-five. C. None. D. Fifty. E. Four four members. Circle graph. A circle graph or pie chart shows the parts of a whole. The following circle graph shows the number of students of class fifth who prefer to play different games. Games: number of students, cricket fifteen, football ten, badminton eight, table tennis five, chess two. Chapter one: Natural disasters. A disaster is an unexpected and devastating event that causes a great loss to life and property. Disasters can be categorized into two groups: natural and man-made. Natural disasters, natural activities that cause a great loss to life and property are called natural disasters like flood, cyclone, earthquake, landslide, drought, tsunami, etc. Man-made disasters. Some disasters occur due to human or machine errors. These disasters are called man-made disasters, like road accidents, rail accidents, fire, bomb explosion, etc. In this chapter, we will study about some natural disasters. Earthquake. The earthquake is a sudden trembling of the earth's crust. It is caused by sudden movement under the surface of the earth. Some earthquakes are weak. These can be barely felt. Some are violent. A powerful earthquake can cause great damage. The study of an earthquakes is called seismology. The intensity of earthquakes is measured by an instrument called seismograph. It is measured on the Richter scale. Safety measure: Do not panic, but act fast. Come out of your house and rush to an open area. If you are unable to move out, take cover under a table to protect yourself from falling objects. Do not stand under trees, electric poles, or tall buildings as they can fall on you. Do not enter a building immediately after an earthquake. Small tremors called aftershocks shake the ground even after an earthquake. 
volcanic eruptions. Magma is found below the Earth's crust in a molten form. Sometimes molten rocks are forced out of cracks from the Earth's crust, accompanied by lots of smoke and ash. This is called lava. Lava is very hot. It causes great damage to life and property in nearby areas. Tsunami Tsunami is a term Japanese used to refer to very swift and powerful sea waves. These waves can be as high as 20 to 30 meters and travel at the speed of 1000 km per hour causing great damage. Tsunami is caused due to undersea earthquakes or volcanic eruptions. The tsunami that hit the coasts of India and some other countries on the Indian coastline on December 26, 2004 killed about 3 lakh people and made thousands homeless. Floods Flood is a natural condition in which rainwater or water from the rivers or dams submerges a large part of land. Floods generally occur in rainy season. It damages crops, roads, property and life. In such time, water supply, communication and electric lines get affected. There is a shortage of food, water, etc. Due to unhygienic conditions, diseases like typhoid, malaria, etc. spread and cause epidemic. Safety measures move to a safer place. Listen to the radio or watch the television for warning and advice. Do not wade through the water. Many poisonous animals can be in the water. Keep a stock of food and fresh water. Keep a first aid kit ready. Drought Drought is also a natural condition in which there is no or very low rainfall in a particular area. This causes severe shortage of water. Land and water bodies dry up and crops fail to grow, resulting in a shortage of food. People die due to hunger and scarcity of water. Such a condition is called a famine. Safety measures Learn to save and conserve water. Grow more trees. Promote harvesting of rainwater. Grow drought-resistant crops such as sorghum, millets and maize. Landslides Sometimes rocks and stones along with mud slide down the hills or mountains. This is called landslide. It occurs frequently during the rainy season. Deforestation is the main cause of landslides. They are common in the Himalayas and the northeastern hilly areas. Landslides cause damage to property and disrupt communication. Safety measures. Be calm. Do not panic. Do not spread rumors. Encourage people to face the problem bravely and be supportive. Contribute and donate clothes food and cash to the agencies involved in relief work. Your contribution. In case of a natural disaster, you should do the following things. Do not create panic by spreading rumors. Help as many victims as you can. Encourage people to face the problem bravely. Contribute food, clothes and cash generously to the agencies, NGOs involved in the relief work and encourage other people to do the same or follow your example. Points to remember. Floods, cyclones, drought, earthquakes and tsunamis are natural disasters. Earthquakes are caused by sudden movement under the surface of the earth. Droughts are caused due to scarcity of rainfall. Floods occur mostly in the rainy season due to excessive rain. During a famine, people start dying of starvation. We should do our utmost to help victims of a natural disaster. Chapter 2 Safety Rules Accidents generally occur due to our carelessness. They can result in minor injuries to severe ones. Some accidents may even result in the death of the victim. Accidents can happen at any time and any place. We can avoid accidents by being alert. We can also avert accidents by following certain safety rules. Let's see how we can avoid accidents at different places. Precautions at home. A number of accidents happen at home. Never play with sharp tools or electric gadgets as you may meet with an accident. 
Do not play or fly kite on the roof. Do not run inside the house. Sometimes fire may also occur due to a short circuit. Do not try to extinguish it with water. Never tease your pet or any other stray animal. It may bite you. Throw banana peels and other wastes only into the dustbin to avoid slipping. Precautions on the road. Always walk on the left side of the road. Do not board or deboard a moving bus or train. Do not peep out of a moving vehicle. Play only at safe places like in parks and playgrounds, not on the road. Cross the road using the subway or the zebra crossing. Learn traffic symbols and follow them. They inform you about the road and traffic. Precautions against fire. The fire is very destructive when it takes the form of conflagrations. So, in order to prevent it, we can adopt following measures. Never play with matchsticks and crackers. Store petrol and kerosene oil in airtight cans away from fires. Do not wear synthetic clothes in the kitchen. Wear cotton clothes only. Make sure that the gas stove is switched off when not in use. If the clothes of a person catch fire, cover him with a blanket or thick cloth. This would cut off air supply and the fire would be extinguished. Putting out fire. Even a small fire in the house can spread very fast and cause great damage. Hence, it is necessary to control it quickly. We can control all types of fires either by cutting off the air supply or by reducing the temperature of the burning material. Fire extinguishers are devices used to put out fire. There are many types of fire extinguishers. They contain carbon dioxide, CO2 gas or foam. The gas or foam surrounds the fire and puts it off by cutting off the air supply. For petrol or kerosene fire, throw sand on the fire to cut off the air supply to it. Water should never be used in this case because petrol is lighter than water and so floats on it. The fire will then spread faster. For electric fire, switch off the electricity mains when the fire is caused by an electric short circuit. Throw sand on the fire. Never throw water over a fire caused by electricity, since water is a good conductor of electricity and you may get an electric shock. Electric fire is very dangerous. We should use the good quality of electric wires, switches and other electric appliances to avoid fire accidents caused by electricity. First aid. We should try to avoid accidents by adopting the safety rules. However, if an accident still happens, the injured person must be given medical aid before doctor's arrival or must be taken to the hospital. The immediate help given to an injured person is called first aid. It is very essential and can save the life of the injured person. Different kinds of injuries need different kinds of first aid. Let us know how to give first aid in different types of accidents. Minor cuts and wounds. First, wash your hands before giving first aid to the injured person. Try to remove all the dirt from the wound with small pads of cotton soaked in Dettol or Savlon. Cover the wound with a clean cotton dressing to stop bleeding. Deep cut. It is very necessary to stop the bleeding if the cut is very deep and bleeding. First, wash the wound with soap and water. Make a thick pad of sterile gaze and press it over the wound. If the bleeding does not stop, use a tight bandage called tourniquet. Nose bleeding. During summer, bleeding from the nose is a very common problem in children. Follow these steps to give first aid in case of nose bleeding. Ask the patient to sit on a chair comfortably with his head tilted back and arms folded above the head. Prepare an ice pack by wrapping ice cubes in a cloth and crushing the ice. Apply the ice pack on the patient's nose. This will also reduce bleeding. 
ask the victim not to blow his nose and breathe through his mouth. Fracture Any break or crack in the bone is called a fracture. The fractured bone causes a lot of pain. The affected area swells up. You cannot treat a fracture on your own. The only first aid you can give is to ensure that the fractured part should not be moved anymore. Follow these steps for first aid in case of fracture. The person with a fractured bone should not be moved without proper support. Keep the patient calm and comfortable and then call a doctor immediately. Tie a splint with extends above and below the fractured bone to give support to the broken bone. If the fracture is in the hand, make a sling using a cloth or a bandage. The sling gives support to the arm and prevents its movement. If the fracture is in the leg, tie a splint around the fractured leg. Do not allow the patient to move his or her leg at all. If the patient has to be moved, he should be carried on a stretcher. Take the patient to a doctor. Sprain Sometimes joints such as the ankle or knee gets twisted and swelled up. The tissues around the twisted joint are damaged. Sprains are very painful. For first aid, a cold ice bag should be used. Rub ointments such as iodex or relaxil over the sprained joint two or three times a day. Wrap a crepe bandage around the sprained joint after rubbing an ointment. Burns One can get burnt with fire, boiling water or milk, crackers and chemicals. In case of minor burns, apply cold water or ice cubes on the burnt area. Also, apply an antiseptic. In case of a severe burn, the victim should be sent to the hospital immediately. Animal Bites The saliva of animals like dogs, cats, monkeys, wolves and jackals contain viruses of a very dangerous disease called rabies. When these animals bite someone, the viruses enter the victim's body through the animal's saliva. They cause rabies to the victim. So, it is very important to treat animal bites immediately. Wash the wound with soap and water to wash away germs. Apply an antiseptic cream on the wound. This would prevent infection. Take the victim to doctor immediately. The doctor may give anti-rabies injections. Snake bites. When a snake such as cobra or crate bites someone, it injects poison into the victim's body. This poison travels through the blood and affects the heart and brain causing death. To stop the flow of blood to the heart and brain, apply a tight bandage just above the bite. Do not move the victim. Any kind of movement will cause the poison to spread faster in the victim's body. Try to get the poison out from the wound as quickly as possible. You can do this by making a cross cut about half centimeter deep over the bite with a blade and by sucking the blood. Take the victim to a doctor. The doctor may give anti-venom injections of polyvalent type. This is available in almost all health centers. Poisoning Boot polish, nail polish, paint, detergents, naphthalene balls and some medicines if swallowed are poisonous and often deadly. Keep the poisonous things out of the reach of children and do not keep them in kitchen also. In case of poisoning, try to make the victim vomit. Give first aid quickly. Take the victim to a doctor immediately. Points to remember. Most of the accidents occur due to our carelessness. We should try to avoid accidents by following safety rules. Different kinds of injuries need different kinds of first aid. Wash your hands before giving first aid to the injured person. If the clothes of a person catch fire, cover him with a blanket or thick cloth. Chapter 3 Simple Machines People do various types of jobs. They do the jobs like cutting of paper or cloth, tightening or loosening of screw, opening the cap of a cold drink bottle, etc. To do these things, we use various tools like scissors, 
screwdriver and bottle opener. All these tools which make our work easier are called simple machines. Simple machines do not have too many parts. There are five main types of simple machines. These are a lever, pulley, screw, inclined plane and wheel and axle. Lever A lever consists of a rod free to move about a fixed point. If we want to move a huge boulder, we cannot move it with our hands. But we can move the boulder with a rod by applying less force. The rod is a kind of lever. A lever has three important points. Load L, Effort E and Fulcrum F. The object to be lifted by a lever is called Load L or Weight W. The force applied on a lever to move lift the object is called Effort E or Pressure P. The point at which a lever turns is called Fulcrum F. Classes of levers Depending upon the position of the fulcrum, load and effort, we can classify levers into three categories. First class levers. In this class of lever, the fulcrum, F, is in between the load, L, and the effort, E. Scissors, claw hammer, and pliers are first class levers. Second class levers. In this class of lever, the load, L, is in between the fulcrum, F and the effort E. Bottle opener, wheelbarrow and nutcracker are second class levers. Third class levers. In this class of lever, the effort E is in between the fulcrum F and the load L. Fishing rods, eye stongs and forceps are third class levers. Inclined plane. An inclined plane is simply a slope over which a load can be pushed up. Most of you have fun playing on a slide in the park. You must have observed that sliding down a smooth slope is faster and easier than climbing up the ladder. This is because the slope is an inclined plane while the ladder is not. Other examples of inclined plane are sloping wooden plank, ramps, slides, staircase, etc. Pulley A pulley is a wheel with a groove around its outer edge. A rope is passed over this groove. Ropes or chains are pulled across a pulley that helps to lift loads by changing the direction of the force applied. By using a bucket fastened to a long rope, people draw water from the wells. If we lift a bucket full of water by pulling the rope, it is a difficult job. A pulley is used for drawing water from a well. It rotates around a rod fitted to a support. A rope is passed over the pulley and the load bucket is attached to one end of it. In order to pull the load up, we apply force or effort downward. A pulley is also used to lift heavy engines and fit them into vehicles. Flags are also hoisted on a flagpole using a pulley. Screw A screw is a very simple machine that looks like a nail with grooves cut into it. It has a winding edge called thread. This winding edge is actually an inclined plane wrapped around a rod. It is helpful in holding things together. A screw fixes two planks of wood better than a nail. Screw jack. A screw jack also works on the principle of a screw. The slope of the screw jack is used to lift cars and trucks. Activity. Aim. To prove that a screw is an inclined plane things required. A pencil and a sheet of paper. Method. Cut out a right angled triangle from a sheet of paper. Color the inclined edge black. Wrap the paper around the pencil as shown in the figure. Result. The inclined edge of the paper can be compared to the threads of a screw. This shows that a screw is actually an inclined plane. Wheel and Excel. A wheel and axle has a large wheel connected to a small rod. These are fixed so that they move together. If we turn the wheel, the axle also turns like in a sewing machine, cars, grinding machines, bicycles and egg beaters have a wheel and axle arrangement. Wedge A wedge is a V-shaped piece generally made up of metal. 
It has two inclined planes which meet at a sharp edge. Axe, sword, blade and knife are some examples of wedge. The sharp blade of a wedge helps in cutting and splitting things. Points to remember. Lever, inclined plane, pulley, screw, wedge, wheel and axle are kinds of simple machines. Levers are of three kinds, first class, second class and third class. Sliding down on a smooth slope, inclined plane is easier. A pulley is a small wheel with a groove around its edge. It changes the direction of force and lifts load. A screw is an inclined plane which is used to hold things together. Chapter 4 Interdependence in Nature We are surrounded by various kinds of living and non-living things. Living things are called biotic components. Bio means life of the environment. Non-living things are called abiotic components of the environment. Thus, the environment is made up of both biotic and abiotic components. We depend on both biotic and abiotic components of the environment for our survival. Biotic components include plants and animals. All other living things also depend on the abiotic and biotic components. Let us see how. Living things depend on abiotic components. Both animals and plants need air to breathe. They use oxygen from air to get energy from food during the process of respiration. Plants also need carbon dioxide from air to make food by the process of photosynthesis. Both animals and plants need water. Water helps animals to carry food to all parts of the body for getting energy. Water is also essential for collecting waste from all over the body and removing it from the body. Plants also use water to prepare food during photosynthesis. Plants absorb minerals dissolved in water through their roots. Plants need soil to grow. Soil provides them with support as well as water and minerals. Soil provides shelter to animals such as ants, rabbits, earthworms and centipedes. The main source of energy on earth is the sun. Plants use the sun's energy, sunlight to make food, which they store in their leaves, stems, fruits and roots. Sunlight also provides plants and animals with warmth for survival. Thus, both plants and animals depend on the sun to get energy. Living things depend on each other. Animals and plants depend on each other. Let us see how. Animals, including humans, depend on plants. All animals depend on plants for food. You know that herbivores eat plants. So, they depend on plants directly. Carnivores eat the flesh of herbivores. So, they depend on plants indirectly. Omnivores eat both plants and flesh of herbivores. So, they depend on plants both directly and indirectly. Animals depend on plants for shelter. Birds build nests, spiders knit webs and bees make hives in trees. Squirrels make holes called drays in tree trunks. Monkeys, chimpanzees and leopards live on trees. Zebra, deer and elephants live under trees. Animals depend on plants for oxygen. When plants make food during photosynthesis, they give out oxygen. Animals need this oxygen to breathe in. Without oxygen, life is not possible on the earth. Plants depend on animals. Plants also depend on animals for many things. Plants depend on animals for carbon dioxide. When animals breathe out, they give out carbon dioxide. Plants use this carbon dioxide in making food. Plants depend on animals to produce seeds. Bees, butterflies and other insects carry pollens from one flower to another when they feed on the nectar of the flowers. Without transfer of pollens from flowers, plants would not produce seeds. Plants depend on animals for dispersal of seeds. Some animals eat fruits and seeds and carry them to far-off places along with their droppings. 
Some seeds have hooks and spines that cling in the fur of animals and reach far off places. Plants also depend on animals for manure. The excreta of animals acts as a good manure. It provides nutrients to plants when added to the soil. Thus, both plants and animals need each other as well as the abiotic components around them to survive. Food chains The interdependent relationship between the plants and animals can be best understood by looking at who eats whom in nature. This can be shown in the form of food chains. All food chains start with plants. The plants use the sun's energy to grow. Since plants can produce their own food, they are called producers. Animals, on the other hand, consume plants. They are called consumers. Herbivores like cow, horse, deer, etc. eat the plants. They are called primary consumers. Carnivores like tiger, lion, wolf, etc. then eat the deer. They are called secondary consumers. Hence, a food chain always begins with a producer, plant, and ends with a consumer, animal. Many food chains operate in nature at the same time. Nature and Human Activities Man has been constantly disturbing nature. He has cut forests so carelessly that many animals have disappeared or became extinct and many more are facing the danger of extinction. Deforestation has reduced the amount of rainfall and increased soil erosion. Excessive use of pesticides and fertilizers has caused water pollution. Due to water pollution, many water animals and plants have lost their lives. It is therefore essential to maintain a balance in nature. Otherwise, our earth will not be a safe place to live. We all should contribute our maximum to make our earth a beautiful place to live on. Restoring Balance in Nature To restore the balance in nature, here are some steps that have been taken by the government. The Indian government has set up a number of wildlife sanctuaries and national parks where hunting is not allowed. This helps protect the animals and restore the balance in nature. Some of them are Periyar Sanctuary, Kerala, Bandipur National Park, Karnataka, Kaziranga National Park, Assam, Kanha National Park, Madhya Pradesh, Corbett National Park, Uttarakhand. In some parts of India, rainwater harvesting has been made compulsory to increase the level of the groundwater. It is compulsory for factories to install equipment that reduces the amount of harmful gases in the smoke given out by factories. Manufacturers of vehicles have to install catalytic converters in vehicles to convert poisonous gases into non-poisonous gases. Natural Resources Air All living things require air for breathing. Oxygen is used up in breathing and burning. But plants supply oxygen back to the atmosphere. Plants need air because they use carbon dioxide from air to prepare their food. Human beings and animals need air because there is oxygen in it which they need for breathing. Thus, air is an indispensable natural resource essential for life. We should do our best to reduce air pollution. We can conserve air by the following methods. By planting as many trees as possible. Trees absorb a large amount of carbon dioxide from air during the process of photosynthesis and add an equal amount of oxygen into air. By separating the harmful substances of industries and automobiles and converting the pollutants to useful products. By using effectively designed smokeless stoves for burning coal, kerosene, etc. Also by using alternative fuels such as CNG and LPG which are less harmful. By following standard guidelines set for using CNG in vehicles and industries. Water. Water is a prime natural resource and utmost necessary thing for survival for both plants and animals. 
we can survive without food for a month, but without water, life cannot last for more than a week. Since the availability of water is limited, there is a shortage of it all over the world. So, it is important to save water whenever possible. This is called conservation of water. Some tips to conserve water are as follows. Do not leave taps running while washing clothes. Wash vehicles with a bucket and cloth instead of a hose pipe. While brushing your teeth, washing your face and hands, don't leave the tap open. Replace damaged or leakage pipes. Close taps tightly. Next, we should not allow water to get polluted. Sewage and waste water from factories should be treated to clean them before throwing them into the rivers or lakes. A simple method has been developed by the scientists to harvest rainwater and increase the groundwater. It is called water harvesting. In this method, the rainwater that falls on the roof of our houses is not allowed to go waste. It is filtered and then sent into a deep hole in the ground. It thus adds to the groundwater. Soil Soil is another important resource that supports the growth of plants and is required by animals and human beings. Soil erosion has increased because of cutting down of trees for making cities and farms. The natural process cannot add the soil at the speed with which it is being eroded. We have already read about the methods of preventing soil erosion in earlier classes and chapter. Forests The most important natural resource is the forest. They provide us with many things such as food, clothing, shelter, wood, fuel, etc. They prevent soil erosion and protect wildlife. They are very essential for maintaining the ecological balance on the earth. Nature replaces the trees that die out or are cut down, but we have been cutting trees faster than they can be replaced. We need to cut trees in a planned way to protect forests. We must plant new trees to replace those that are cut down. Fuels Petroleum, coal and natural gas are the main fuels used by humans. These are obtained from under the ground. They are not being replaced by natural process. So we have to conserve these resources. Our scientists have developed methods of using the energy of the sun for cooking food, heating water or for making electricity. Minerals The minerals are chemical substances which are formed naturally in the ground. The reserves for minerals are also limited. One method of conserving them is to recycle them. For example, broken glass bottles or metal cans can be melted and used to make other things. Even paper, which is made from wood, can be recycled. This saves more trees from being cut down. Man and Conservation Human being is the most intelligent being on the earth. Humans are using the earth's resources not only to meet their basic needs, but also to fulfill their comforts and luxuries. Today, due to rapid industrialization, overexploitation and pollution of natural resources have become a global problem. In order to control overexploitation and pollution of the natural resources, our government has enacted many laws and legislations. But controlling overexploitation of resources and pollution should not be left only for the government. Through social, cultural and religious organizations, we should educate people about the pollution and exploitation of natural resources. Points to remember The environment is made up of biotic, living and abiotic, non-living components. Animals and plants depend on each other. A food chain describes who eats whom in nature. Human activities upset the balance in nature. To increase the level of groundwater, rainwater harvesting is made compulsory. Chapter 1 World Famous Personalities The world is grateful to the people who have sacrificed their lives for the sake of humanity. Their selfless services rendered to the well-being of humanity always remain in hearts. 
Let's study about some of them. Abraham Lincoln, 1809-1865 Abraham Lincoln was born in 1809 in a very poor family in the United States of America. He attended school for less than a year in his entire life. He worked on the farm of his father. He also worked as a farm laborer, a boatman, a log chopper, and even a storekeeper. Abraham's stepmother encouraged him to read and write. Somehow he studied law. After trying his hand at various jobs, he became a lawyer. He was very successful as a lawyer. People used to call him Honest Abe because of his honesty. Abe was the nickname of Abraham in his childhood. Abraham entered politics to serve the people. At the age of only 25, he was elected to the Illinois House of Representatives. In 1846, Abraham Lincoln was elected a parliamentarian. In those days, slavery was common in the USA. People from Africa called Negroes or Blacks were brought there as slaves. They were beaten, starved and treated as if they were worse than animals. Abraham Lincoln was against slavery. He was elected President of the United States of America in 1860. The USA was divided into two parts on the question of slavery. The northern states of the USA supported Lincoln in his mission of abolition of slavery. But the southern states were in favor of slavery. Soon a civil war broke out between the northern and the southern states. Abraham Lincoln declared that the USA could not be half free and half slave while the civil war was going on in 1862. For the sake of the unity of the country, he made an unflinching determination to abolish slavery. He fought the war bravely and won it. Thus, Abraham Lincoln succeeded in keeping the USA united and abolished slavery in 1863. Lincoln had become so popular in the USA that he was elected the president for the second term too. He declared a policy of peace to heal the wounds caused in people's mind due to the civil war. However, there were some people who did not like his views. Before he could assume his duties as president, he was shot dead in a theater in Washington, D.C. by Wilkie's Booth in 1865. His death was mourned all over the world. Karl Marx, 1818-1883 The workers were paid meager wages even though the Industrial Revolution had made the factory owners very rich. Thus, society was divided into two classes, the capitalists or rich people and the laborers or the workers. The capitalists were concerned only with their own profits. They did not take care of their workers. The workers led a miserable life. It was during this period that Karl Marx came forward in support of the workers. Karl Marx was born in Germany in 1818 in a very rich family. Karl Marx and his friend Friedrich Engels advised the workers to unite and fight against the capitalists. Karl Marx thought out an idea that the workers should have a share in the ownership and profits of the factories. He, along with Friedrich Engels, published his ideas in a famous book, The Communist Manifesto. Karl Marx also wrote a book called Das Kapital. In these books, he advocated the idea of equality. The rich people of Germany, France and Belgium were upset with his ideas. Karl Marx left Germany and went to England. Here, he kept on spreading his ideas through his writings till his death in 1883. Karl Marx's ideas of communism greatly influenced V.I. Lenin of Russia. He led the famous communist revolution in Russia and overthrew the autocracy of the Caesar. Lenin introduced the Marxist socialist system of government in Russia. Mahatma Gandhi, 1869 to 1948. 
Mahatma Gandhi was born on 2nd October 1869 at Porbandar in Gujarat. His full name was Mohandas Karam Chand Gandhi. After studying law in London, he settled in South Africa and began his career as a lawyer. South Africa was ruled by the British at that time. The blacks of Africa and the Indians were badly treated by the British. Gandhiji decided to fight against this injustice. He organized the blacks and told them to protest against the injustice using non-violent methods. Gandhiji told his followers that they were fighting to establish the truth. So, he called his method of fighting Satyagraha. Gandhiji continued his fight for about 20 years. Finally, he was successful in abolishing many discriminatory laws. Mahatma Gandhi organized mass movements against the unjust rule of the British after he had returned from South Africa in 1915. His movements were based on Satyagraha. The methods he adopted were non-violence, ahimsa and disobedience of unjust laws. In 1942, Gandhiji launched the Quit India Movement and warned the British to leave India immediately. The British had no other way but to bow before the might of Satyagraha and non-violence. Thus, India became an independent country on 15th August 1947. Gandhiji gave the name Harijans or People of God to the untouchables. He was also a champion of Hindu-Muslim unity. Because of these high ideals, he is called the father of the nation. Some people were opposed to the ideals of Gandhiji. In 1948, on 30th January, while he was going for a prayer meeting, a Hindu fanatic, Nathuram Godse, shot him dead. Gandhiji is remembered throughout the world as a great soul. In fact, the word Mahatma means a great soul. Martin Luther King, 1929-1969 Although Abraham Lincoln, the President of the USA, had already abolished slavery from the USA, it was still practiced in many places. In buses, there were separate seats for blacks and whites. Martin Luther King began a movement to fight against this injustice. He was born on 15th January 1929 at Atlanta in the United States of America. Gandhiji's ideas of non-violence greatly influenced Martin Luther, the king. He visited India in 1959 to understand Gandhiji's Satyagraha. He adopted Gandhiji's non-violent method of protest. Thousands of blacks joined him in his famous march to Washington on 28th August 1963. About 2 lakh people followed him. In 1964, a law was passed which gave equal rights to the blacks in the USA. Martin Luther King, like Mahatma Gandhi, was shot dead by an assassin in 1968. He was awarded the Nobel Prize for Peace in 1964. Mother Teresa, 1910-1997 Mother Teresa's real name was Agnes Gongza Mojeksu. She was born in Albania. At the age of 16, she became a nun. In 1929, she came to Calcutta, now Kolkata, India, to teach at a convent. Here she was called Teresa. There was a slum near the convent. One day, she noticed that the people living in the slum were very poor. Their children were ill-fed and sick. She started going to the slum daily to distribute food, clothes and medicines. Mother Teresa founded an organization called the Missionaries of Charity in 1950. She took a pledge to serve the humanity. She also established the Nirmal Hrida home for the physically challenged people near the Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose International Airport in Kolkata. Mother Teresa started her work with only four sisters. 
Today, more than 2,000 sisters are carrying out the activities started by Mother Teresa. She founded old age home, hospitals, schools and orphanages. She was conferred with many more. Mother Teresa received many awards such as the Maxese Award and Bharat Ratna Award. She was also awarded the Nobel Prize for Peace in 1979. Mother Teresa died in 1997, but she will remain in our hearts forever. Points to Remember Abraham Lincoln abolished slavery from the USA. Karl Marx united the workers all over the world. Mahatma Gandhi led the freedom movement in India. Martin Luther King fought against the injustice to blacks in the USA. Mother Teresa was a champion of the weak and the poor children.
Chapter 2 The United Nations Many European countries began to produce goods in bulk after the Industrial Revolution. They needed raw materials at cheaper rate and big market to sell their goods. To fulfill these objectives, they started capturing poor countries of Asia and Africa. They found both raw materials and new markets to sell their goods in these countries. To establish their monopoly on foreign trade, all these European countries started fighting among themselves. This finally resulted in a big war in which many countries of the world were involved. It came to be known as the First World War. It started in 1914 and lasted for over four years till 1918. The destruction caused by this war forced the prominent leaders of the world to sit together and think how they could prevent such destructive war. They decided to form an organization called the League of Nations. It was formed in 1919. However, this organization failed to achieve its objectives and became non-functional. After the failure of the League of Nations, another great war called the Second World War broke out in 1939. The war started with Adolf Hitler's invasion on Poland. It was the first global war in the real sense. The destruction caused by this war was much more than the First World War. The United States of America dropped two atom bombs on the Japanese cities Hiroshima on 6th August and Nagasaki on 9th August in 1945. The two cities were reduced to ashes within minutes. Formation of the United Nations UN the Second World War forced the leaders of the world to unite together to find ways to avoid wars in future as the war caused innumerable human death and a great demolition of natural resources. After many discussions, finally the Charter of the United Nations was adopted at a conference in San Francisco, USA. It was signed by 50 member countries including India on 24th October 1945. Now, this day is celebrated as the UN Day every year. The term United Nations was coined by the US President Franklin D. Roosevelt. The UN achieves its goals through dialogue and consensus among all its member states or countries. Today, 193 countries are the members of the UN. The headquarters of the UN are located in New York. Objectives of the United Nations UN The main objectives of the UN are to maintain peace and security all over the world, to promote good relations among the countries of the world on the principle of equal rights, to solve economic, social and cultural problems, peacefully, to promote human rights and human freedom for all the people irrespective of their color, caste, creed, sex or language. Declaration of Human Rights To achieve its objectives, the UN issued a Declaration of Human Rights called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It was adopted on 10 December 1948. This day is celebrated as the Human Rights Day every year. Some of the rights mentioned in the Declaration are the right of freedom, the right of equality before law, the right to education, the right to employment, the freedom of speech and writing, the freedom to follow any religion. Points to remember the First World War started in 1914 and lasted in 1918. The League of Nations was formed in 1919. The Second World War broke out in 1939. The United Nations was formed on 24th October 1945. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted on 10th December 1948. Chapter 3 Organs of the United Nations The chief objective of the UN is to solve the international problems like illiteracy, poverty and disease, problem of environment 
and agriculture. It also provides financial support to the developing countries so that they can improve the living standard of their people. It provides technical help to the developing countries. Main Organs of the United Nations The main organs of the UN are the General Assembly, the Security Council, the Secretariat, the Economic and Social Council, the International Code of Justice, the Trusteeship Council, the General Assembly. The most important and largest organ of the UNO is the General Assembly, which are composed of the entire member countries of the world. It consists of all the members of the UN. Each country has one member. A two-thirds majority is needed to pass a resolution on any important issue. The General Assembly meets once a year, usually on the third Tuesday of September. However, it can hold special meetings whenever necessary. The General Assembly also elects the Secretary General on the recommendation of the Security Council. The members of the General Assembly elect one member as the President and one as the Vice President every year. The General Assembly also approves the budget of the UN. The Security Council The Security Council is the most powerful organ of the UN. Its main function is to maintain peace. The Security Council listens to the complaints of member countries and tries to restore peace. Its decisions are final and all the UN members have to accept its decisions. The Security Council has the power to enforce its decisions through military action or economic sanctions. The Security Council consists of 15 member nations. Five of them are permanent and 10 are elected, each for two years. The permanent members are the United States of America, United Kingdom, France, Russia and China. These members have a veto power. It means to pass any motion, all the permanent members must vote in its favor. A single negative vote by any permanent member would prevent the motion from being passed. The 10 non-permanent members do not enjoy the veto power. The Secretariat Approximately 40,000 staff are engaged all over the world to carry out everyday activities of the UN. The UN Secretariat has employed these people. The head of the Secretariat is the Secretary General. He or she is appointed by the General Assembly on the recommendation of the Security Council for a period of five years. He or she brings to the Security Council any matter related to peace and security. Whenever two countries have a conflict, he or she tries to bring them together for discussions. The Economic and Social Council ECOSOC the Economic and Social Council, ECOSOC, looks after the economical, social and cultural programs of the UN. It provides help to the developing countries for the progress of education, health and culture. It also sends food, clothes and medicines to the people affected by natural calamities. The headquarters of the ECOSOC is in New York. The International Court of Justice all the legal problems of international level are settled in the International Court of Justice. The court has 15 judges to serve a nine-year term. The judges are elected by the General Assembly and the Security Council. No two judges may represent the same country. The President and the Vice President of the court are elected for a three-year term. They can also be re-elected when their term expires. The court has its headquarters at Hague in the Netherlands. The Trusteeship Council The Trusteeship Council was established to look after those regions of the world that were not independent then. But now all the countries of the world have become independent. So the Trusteeship Council is not functional anymore. Agencies of the UN 
the different functions are performed by the several agencies that work under the supervision of the UN. Member countries provide financial assistance for the work of these agencies. Let us study the functions of some agencies. United Nations Children's Emergency Fund, UNICEF Set up in 1946, UNICEF works for the welfare of the children. This is the only agency that works for children. The UNICEF assists its member countries in solving the problems of illiteracy, malnutrition and diseases among the children. The UNICEF has launched a program called Anganwadi in India. Under this program, children from various villages are brought together to work, play and sing. Their mothers are also taught how to take care of them. They are made aware of the importance of a balanced diet and the ways of cooking nutritious food. The UNICEF sells its own greeting cards to collect money. We should buy these cards to help the poor children. The headquarters of the UNICEF is in New York. World Health Organization, WHO The WHO was established in 1948 with its headquarters at Geneva in Switzerland. Its main aim is to fight against diseases and improve the health of the people worldwide. The WHO has pioneered the slogans like Health is Common Build and Health for All and All for Health. Eradication of smallpox has become possible because of the efforts of the WHO. It is now fighting against diseases such as malaria, tuberculosis and AIDS. United Nations Educational, Social and Cultural Organization, UNESCO The UNESCO was established in 1946 with an objective to encourage countries to cooperate in the fields of education, science and culture. It provides help to less developed countries by educating people about farming methods, scientific knowledge and teacher training. The UNESCO also helps to preserve historical monuments. The headquarters of the UNESCO is in Paris, France. Apart from these agencies, there are many other agencies of the UN. Some of them are the Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO, International Labor Organization, ILO, International Monetary Fund, IMF, and International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA. These agencies perform different functions. Major Achievements of the UN The credit for maintaining peace and order in the world since the Second World War goes to the UN. The wars between India and Pakistan, Iran and Iraq, Israel and the Arab countries, North and South Korea and many others were stopped from becoming world wars. The UN has been very successful in arms control, especially in preventing the use of nuclear weapons. It has also achieved its aims of reducing poverty, illiteracy and diseases in many parts of the world. The UN has been doing its best to make our world a peaceful place to live in. Points to remember The Security Council is the most powerful organ of the UN. The Secretary General is the head of the Secretariat. The International Court of Justice settles legal problems of international level. Chapter 4 India's Contribution to the UN In the very same year when the UN was established, India got its membership. India has always followed the policy of non-violence. It has also played an important role in promoting world peace through the UN. Some of the main contributions of India to the UN are as follows. India sent its peacekeeping forces through the UN to Korea, Zaire, Egypt, Sudan, Cyprus and Sri Lanka to maintain peace in those places. India strongly opposed the policy of apartheid followed by the government of South Africa. Under this policy, blacks were treated as inferiors to whites. 
relations with South Africa were re-established only after the policy of apartheid was abolished. India has always supported the Palestinians against Israeli occupation of their territories. An important resolution was passed by the UN General Assembly that all the countries under foreign rule should be freed as soon as possible. India has put forward this resolution in 1960. Many Indians have occupied important posts in various UN agencies. Vijaya Lakshmi Pandit was the first woman to be elected the President of the General Assembly. Similarly, Shashi Tharoor has served as the Under Secretary General of the UN in recent years. The Non-Alignment, India's Greatest Contribution India has contributed a lot to the UN in many ways, especially by advocating the policy of non-alignment. After the Second World War, the USA and the USSR emerged as superpowers. They did not trust each other. Many smaller countries sided with either the USA or the USSR. Thus, two groups of nations were formed. Soon they started increasing their arms and ammunitions and military presence wherever possible. The newly independent countries of Asia and Africa were once again threatened by the domination of the superpowers. There was a possibility of another world war. The prevailing circumstances forced Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, the then Prime Minister of India, Marshal Tito, the then President of Yugoslavia, and Gamal Abdel Nasser, the then president of Egypt, to ponder over the ongoing issues. They decided that it was in the interest of the developing countries not to join either of the groups, but to remain neutral or non-aligned. The leaders jointly laid down five principles, Panchil, according to which all countries should cooperate with one another. These principles took the form of a big movement called the Non-Aligned Movement, NAM. The NAM was born in 1961 with its first meeting at Belgrade in Yugoslavia. Nehru, Nasser and Tito are called the founding fathers of the NAM. Initially, the NAM had only 25 members, but today it has more than 100 members. Main Objectives of the NAM the main objectives of the NAM are as follows, to keep away from the superpowers, to have friendly relations with all countries, to solve the problems of poverty, illiteracy and health jointly, to promote trade and commerce among the member countries, to work for the welfare of the people. Points to remember. India strongly opposed the policy of apartheid followed by the government of South Africa. The USA and the USSR were the two superpowers of the world. Non-aligned movement was based on five principles or Panchil. Nehru, Nasser and Tito were the founding fathers of the NAM. Chapter 5 The British in India once India was called the Golden Bird as it was a very rich country. It traded with Persia and Arabian countries in goods like silk, pearl, spices, gold, etc. These goods were famous in the world. Persia and Arab countries had trade relations with India. Indian spices and silk were highly popular. Around the middle of the 15th century, European countries also decided to trade with India. Vasco da Gama, a Portuguese sailor, was the first European to discover a sea route to India. He went around Africa and landed at Calicut in Kerala in 1498. Soon the Portuguese defeated the Arab traders and took control of the spice trade. They established trading centers at Cochin, Kochi, Calicut, Kozikod, and Kananor, Kanor. The prosperity of the Portuguese traders attracted other European countries to trade with India. The Dutch, French, 
and British took keen interest in trading with India. This led to rivalry among the European countries and they started fighting against one another. Finally, the British defeated the others and threw them out from the Indian soil. The East India Company, formed by a group of British traders in 1600, decided to establish trade links with India. The company established its first trading center at Surat in Gujarat. Thereafter, the Mughal Emperor Jahangir gave permission to the company to set up its trading centers at Madras, Chennai, Calcutta, Kolkata, and Bombay, Mumbai. The Battle of Plassey when the Nawab of Bengal, Sirajuddaula, saw the British building forts and maintaining armies at their trading centers, he got suspicious. He ordered the British to close their forts and remove the armies. The British refused to do so and declared a war against him. In the Battle of Plassey in 1757, the British under the leadership of Robert Clive defeated Sirajuddaula. Thereafter, the British became very powerful. In India, the British Raj started to establish after the Battle of Plassey. Within the next hundred years, the East India Company succeeded in establishing its control over the entire country. Expansion of the British Power The successful annexation of Bengal gave the British an opportunity to expand their territory. They took advantage of the disunity among the Indian kings and princes. They supported one king against another and in turn gained power and wealth. The British also inducted Indian soldiers in their army. They used this army to capture a very large part of India. They also signed treaties with the kings who accepted British supremacy discontentment among Indians. The British wanted to make more and more money from India. The farmers in India were forced to grow indigo used for dyeing clothes and sell it to the British at a low price. As a result, the farmers became very poor while the British made huge profits. The Indian artisans and weavers were forced to sell their goods only to the British and that too at a low price. The British collected raw materials from India and supplied it to their industries in England. Finished goods from the British factories were sold in India at a higher price. Because of this, the Indian industries suffered a lot. The British introduced many unjust laws to annex other princely states of India. One such law was called the Doctrine of Lapse. This law stated that if a ruler died without a child, his kingdom would be taken over by the British. Aud, Satara and Chhansi were made British territories under this law. This law made the Indian kings and Nawabs very upset. The fleecing policies of the British annoyed all the sections of society, such as workers, farmers, Nawabs, prince and king. This led to widespread discontentment among Indians. Whenever such a situation existed, it was suppressed by the British with a heavy hand. The Revolt of 1857 The discontentment caused by the British policies made the native people come closer and think of their freedom from British rule. The people of all sections unitedly revolted against the government in 1857 to get themselves free from the unjust rule of the British. This revolt is known as the Revolt of 1857. Some people also call it the First War of Independence or the Sepoy Mutiny. The immediate cause of the revolt was the introduction of the new Enfield rifles in the army. To load the rifles, the soldiers had to bite off the ends of greased cartridges. A rumor spread that the cartridges were greased with the fat of cows and pigs. The Hindus regard cows as sacred and the Muslims regard pigs as unclean. Therefore, both the Hindu and the Muslim soldiers refused to use these cartridges. 
on 29th March 1857, Mangal Pandey, a young Indian soldier, shot dead a British officer near Calcutta, now Kolkata, following which he was hanged on 8th April 1857. The incident angered the Indian soldiers. The Indian soldiers on 10th May 1857 captured Meerut after they shot dead their British officers. Then they marched to Delhi and declared the Mughal Emperor Bahadur Shah Zafar as their ruler. Soon the revolt spread to other parts of the country. Different leaders led the revolt in different parts of India. Some of the prominent leaders were Nana Sahib, Tantia Tope, Kumar Singh, Liya Katali, Rani Lakshmi Bai of Jhansi and Begum Hazrat Mahal of Aud. You might have read about the sacrifice of Rani Lakshmi Bai. The British suppressed the revolt mercilessly. The leaders were either hanged or ruthlessly killed. Bahadur Shah was exiled to Rangoon, Burma, Myanmar, where he died in 1862. In 1858, the rule of the East India Company came to an end. The British government took control of India. Queen Victoria of England was declared the Empress of India. India became a colony of the British Empire. The British government appointed a viceroy to rule over India. The revolt of 1857 inspired Indians to continue their struggle and fight for independence. Points to remember Vasco da Gama discovered the sea route to India in 1498. The East India Company was formed in 1600. The Battle of Plassey was fought in 1757. The Revolt of 1857 is also known as the First War of Independence. Chapter 6 India's Struggle for Freedom The Indian political and social thinkers were of the opinion that the evil practices were responsible for the failure of the revolt of 1857. They realized that the abolition of evil practices such as child marriage, caste system, sati and parda systems was necessary for the progress of Indian society. They also realized that this could be done through education. Several social and religious reformers like Ishwar Chandra Vidya Sagar, Raja Ram Mohan Roy, Sir Syed Ahmed Khan and Dayanand Saraswati did a lot in this regard. Raja Ram Mohan Roy successfully got the sati system banned in India. The Indian National Congress Many learned people of India began to form associations and organizations to create awareness among the people. They started discussing problems and tried to find out their solutions. People were sure that freedom from the British rule was the only way for solving their problems. In 1885, the Indian National Congress emerged as a strong and big political organization. The credit for the formation of the Indian National Congress goes to a retired British officer A O Hume. Therefore, he is called the father of the Indian National Congress. Bhumesh Chandra Banerjee was the first president of the Indian National Congress which was held in Mumbai. The other prominent leaders were Dada Bhai Nehru ji, Firoz Shah Mehta, Surendra Nath Banerjee and Gopal Krishna Gokhale The leaders of the Indian National Congress put their demands through peaceful methods since the demands of the congress were moderate in nature the leaders like Dada Bhai Nehru ji WC Banerjee SN Banerjee and Gopal Krishna Gokhale were referred to as moderates however there were some other leaders like Bal Gangadhar Tilak Pipin Chandrapal and Lala Lajpat Rai who did not support the soft approach towards the British rule they preferred a stronger and more active opposition to the British rule these leaders came to be known as extremists Bal Gangadhar Tilak openly declared freedom is my birthright and i shall have it he started a newspaper called K 
Kesari, in which he played the policies of the British government. The three leaders, Lala Lajpat Rai, Bal Ganga Dhar Tilak, and Bipin Chandra Pal, later came to be known as Lal Bal Pal. Divide and Rule Policy The British government pursued the policy of divide and rule to weaken the freedom movement. In this regard, the province of Bengal was partitioned into two parts in 1905, one for the Hindus and the other for the Muslims. The Indian National Congress and the people of India sternly opposed the division of Bengal. The anger in the people gave rise to the Swadeshi movement. The Swadeshi movement. The people inspired by this movement started to use homemade goods and boycotted the use of foreign goods. This agitation was called the Swadeshi movement. During this movement, people made bonfires of British clothes and other articles at several places. The movement soon spread to all parts of the country. The British government was unable to suppress this movement. Finally, the scheme to divide Bengal was withdrawn in 1911. The Revolutionaries there were some leaders who believed in fighting against the British by using violent measures. After the partition of Bengal, this thinking gained momentum, especially among the youths. This thinking came to be known as revolutionary. Prominent revolutionaries of this period were Ashwini Kumar, Brahmabandhab Upadhyay, Khudiram Bose and Aurobindo Ghosh. Khudiram Bose was hanged at the age of just 15. Some Indians went to other countries and operated from there. Madame Kama went to Switzerland and started a paper called Vande Mataram. Maulana Barkatullah and Raja Mahendra Pratap went to Kabul, Afghanistan and guided the freedom movement from there. Narendranath Chattopadhyay formed an association in England. Lala Hardayal formed the Qatar Party in America to help Indian revolutionaries break out of the First World War. Before the outbreak of the First World War, the British introduced certain reformative policy to appease the Indians, but these reforms could not satisfy the people. Meanwhile, the First World War broke out in 1914. The British government announced that it would grant freedom to India after the World War. Indians helped the British government in the World War. When the war ended, the British government refused to give them even political concessions. They made even more strict laws under which any person could be put into jail without trial. These laws angered the people of India and massive demonstrations and strikes were organized throughout the country. It was during this period when Gandhiji returned to India from South Africa. He led the freedom struggle of the Indians for the next 30 years. Points to remember The Indian National Congress was formed in 1885 by A.O. Hume. The British government divided Bengal into two parts in 1905. The Swadeshi movement was launched to boycott British goods. W.C. Banerjee was the first president of the Indian National Congress. World War I broke out in 1914. Chapter 7 Gandhiji and the Freedom Movement Mahatma Gandhi went to South Africa to practice law and safeguard the Indian workers over there. He fought for the rights of the Indian workers. In 1915, he returned to India. Gopal Krishna Gokhale advised him to take a tour around India. Gopal Krishna Gokhale is considered the political guru of Gandhiji. Gandhiji made an extensive tour all over India. He was shocked with what he saw. People were poor, illiterate and unemployed. Social evils like untouchability and casteism kept the people divided and backward. He realized that if India was to become free, then social evils would have to be removed completely. The Hindus and the Muslims had to unite to fight against the British. Gandhiji renamed the untouchables as Harijans, meaning the people of God. He quickly won the support of the masses. 
Satyagraha became his most important weapon against the British. You already know that Gandhiji had successfully used this method in South Africa. The Jallianwala Bagh Massacre The people assembled at Jallianwala Bagh to peacefully oppose the inhuman laws to seize the fundamental rights of the people. The Rowlett Act of 1919 was one of such acts. Under this act, any person could be arrested without a trial. Gandhiji asked the people to oppose this act. Demonstrations and meetings were held against this act all over the country. One such peaceful meeting was being held at Jallianwala Bagh in Amritsar on 13th April 1919. It was attended by about 10,000 men, women, and children. General Dyer. ordered the british soldiers to block the only entrance to the park and open fire on the public thousands of men women and children were either killed or injured as they could not escape from the park the incident shocked the whole nation it was a cold blooded massacre and parallel in history general dyer was forced to resign in march 1920 the non cooperation movement Gandhi ji launched the non-cooperation movement against the Jallianwala Bagh massacre in 1920. He also wanted to bring Hindu-Muslim unity. He asked the people not to cooperate with the British. During this period, Subhash Chandra Bose resigned from the Indian civil services and joined the non-cooperation movement. Thousands of students left their colleges and schools. Lawyers boycotted the courts. people left government jobs and joined the movement gandhi ji wanted that the movement should be peaceful and free from violence however in 1922 when the people became violent at chori chora in gorakhpur and killed 22 policemen gandhi ji called off the movement some people were very unhappy with the decision of gandhi ji but gandhi ji refused to change his decision because he believed very strongly in the policy of non violence young leaders like jawahar lal nehru subhash chandra bose maulana abdul kalam azad and sarojini naidu emerged from the non cooperation movement the simon commission the british government appointed the simon commission under the chairmanship of sir john simon to bring changes in the administration of india in 1927 however not a single indian was included in this commission when the commission came to india in 1928 people greeted it with the slogan simon go back Lala Lajpat Rai known as Sher-e Punjab led one such demonstration in Lahore he was brutally beaten up with lathis and died later in lucknow govind pallab pant and jawahar lal nehru were injured the demand for purna swaraj the congress session at lahore in 1929 decided to demand purna swaraj or complete independence for india Pandit Jawahar Lal Nehru became the president of the Indian National Congress. The Civil Disobedience Movement. The British had introduced the Salt Law. According to this law, people could not make salt from sea water. Gandhi ji decided to break this law. He, along with his followers, marched from Sabarmati Ashram in Ahmedabad to Dandi on the sea shore. Thousands of people took part in this march known as the Dandi march by evaporating sea water at Dandi Gandhi ji and his followers made salt and broke the british law thus Gandhi ji showed the british that the indians would no more obey british laws the dandi march was a part of the civil disobedience movement launched by gandhi ji in 1930 Gandhi ji asked the people not to pay taxes to the government the civil disobedience movement spread to every part of the country Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan led the movement in the northwestern part Rani Gaiden Lu led it in the northeast Chakravarti Rajagopalachari led the Vedaranyam Satyagraha in the south to suppress the movement the british arrested Gandhi ji Jawahar Lal Nehru and other prominent leaders of the Congress. 
However, the civil disobedience movement became a way of life for millions of Indians and the movement, even without leaders, grew apace every day. New Generation of Revolutionaries You already know that revolutionaries wanted to fight with the British through violent methods. In the later part of the freedom movement, young revolutionaries like Bhagat Singh, Raj Guru, Sukhdev, Ram Prasad Pismil, Ashfaqullah Khan and Chandrasekhar Azad were in the forefront. Bhagat Singh and B. K. Dutt threw bombs in the Central Assembly Hall. They were arrested and tried in the court. Later, they were hanged. The Government of India Act 1935 the civil disobedience movement was such a large movement that the British became ready to introduce certain reforms in India. In 1935, they passed the Government of India Act. Elections were held throughout the country. The Congress won in most provinces and formed governments. The British forced the Indians to join the war when the Second World War broke out in 1939. They did not consult the Indian leaders. In protest, the Congress ministers in the provinces resigned. In 1940, Muhammad Ali Jinnah at the session of the Muslim League demanded a separate homeland called Pakistan for the Muslims. The Quit India Movement To pacify the Indian leaders, the British government sent a mission to India under Sir Stafford Cripps, but the talks failed. In August 1942, under the leadership of Mahatma Gandhi, the Indian National Congress launched the Quit India Movement. The British immediately arrested Gandhiji and other leaders. The Azad Hind Forge Subhash Chandra Bose was elected the President of Indian National Congress twice. He wanted to launch direct action against the British. He escaped from the jail in 1941 and reached Germany. From there, he went to Japan and formed an army called the Azad Hind Forge or the Indian National Army in 1943. The army fought against the British Army in the northeast borders of India. Unfortunately, the Indian National Army was defeated by the British Army. Many members of the Indian National Army were captured and imprisoned. Subhash Chandra Bose pioneered the slogans Jai Hind and Give Me Blood, I Will Give You Freedom. India Wins Freedom When the Second World War ended in 1945, the British held discussions with the Congress leaders. They finally realized that Indians would never settle for less than freedom. The divide and rule policy of the British left the country divided into two parts, India and Pakistan. Pakistan became a Muslim state, while India a secular state, where people of all religions lived together as one nation and one people. Gandhiji was against the division of India, finally on 15th August 1947. The British granted independence to India, but Gandhiji's dream of a united India had been shattered. Jawaharlal Nehru became the first Prime Minister of Independent India. Points to Remember Gandhiji fought in South Africa for the right of the Indian workers. The Jallianwala Bagh massacre took place on 13th April 1919. The non-cooperation movement was launched in 1920. The Simon Commission came to India in 1928. The Civil Disobedience Movement was launched in 1930. The Quit India Movement was launched in 1942. India became an independent country on 15th August 1947.